right, and welcome to the Stardom Cast, your weekly audio source of all things World Wonder Ring Stardom. I'm your host, Rob Goodwin, and I'm joined as ever by Mr. Matt Turner himself. Matt Turner, how the devil be you? Rob Goodwin, as you know, and as our fantastic listeners, friends and family of the Stardom Cast know, I'm always in a great mood. I'm a very, very lucky, very, very blessed man. But uh, for this episode, I'm even in a better mood for several reasons. Number one, as we record this, this is on a Wednesday, and AEW Grand Slam is tonight's. Brian Danielson versus Nigel McGuinness, the first time in like 15 years, plus just an absolutely loaded card with Darby Allen and John Moxley. Mariah May, former stardom champion, taking on uh, Yuka Sakazaki for the uh, AEW Women's Championship. A whole, bu- a whole bunch of great wrestling action coming on later tonight, again, as we record. Plus, we have the finals of the Dream Star Grand Prix this weekend. We have, and I obviously we'll get into it, we have Tony Storm is coming to stardom but a week earlier than we thought. Super excited for that. Lots of great stuff coming on. And Rob Goodwin, you know me. You know us. We also like to give that listener retention at the end of the show. So I'm going to make mention that I didn't, something that I didn't even text you about, Mr. Rob Goodwin. During EO and Kyrie Watch this week, we may have, under the radar, gotten a little shout out on Monday Night Raw this week. I will hold everybody to that. I didn't even text you about it. Oh. But uh, yes, yes, I will make mention. They did not mention the Stardom cast, but they did say something. I was like, I wonder if that's about us. And we will make mention at the end of the episode to the point where, again, where sometimes I text you certain things and sometimes I'm like, no, I want Rob's live reaction. So, Rob, not only do we have this fantastic news to talk about, we have great shows to talk about, we have previewing great shows, but you and Kyrie watch just got that much more tastier at the end of this episode, my friend. So, uh, but um, again, I'm fantastic. I know, Rob, uh, you had a little bit of an accident playing what we call <laughs> soccer. Uh, we call soccer. You call football. I know you're a little bit of pain, but uh, just let our fantastic, fantastic listeners and uh, friends of the Stardom cast tell everybody how you're doing, brother. Yeah, so um, it, I love the fact that you said you had a little accent. It makes it sound like I've uh, I've crapped myself or something. But, uh, <laughs> No, I am. Um, I just basically fell funny because um, it's always innocuous, isn't it? These uh, these injuries. I fell funny basically and because of the way I fell. I couldn't break my fall, so I fractured the base of the left hand side of my rib cage, um, which is painful enough on its own. But then I've also done the ligaments down my left hand side as well. So you know, I've had to drive to the doctors today to get my uh, to get an extension on my sick note, and you know things like turning around to uh, to check because I'm reversing absolute agony. Going over even the smallest blip in the road is just really really painful. So yeah, it serves me right. Um, I think sport is a young man's game, Matt. Kirsty did say to me, "Do you remember that time you wanted to become a wrestler?" Which uh, which made me laugh as I seem to get injured with the most ridiculous things. So uh, perhaps it was a good job I uh, I did my calf before I went for that first wrestling school lesson, Matt. Yeah, I, and again, I know you've been, again, as we call soccer in the States, you call football over there in England. How long have you been playing football for, Rob? I mean, because I, obviously you're, me and you are around the same age, and I know that you play one or two games a week. But did you play like football in, in your youth and like throughout uh, school and whatnot? Yeah, I, so I played 11 a side um, pretty much since I was about seven, eight. Um, and, you know, not blowing my own trumpet, but I was pretty good. Um, and then I discovered beer and, you know, <laughs> going out and trying to make girls laugh and like me. Um, and therefore, football fell by the wayside. Um, so I, I sort of played like five a side and stuff like that. And then I thought about, a year, about a year ago, I was like, "Oh, I'm going to try 11 aside again." Because I was good at it when I was 18. Um, I am not 18 anymore, Mr. Matt Turner. Um, and despite the fact that I play or attempt to play like I'm still 18, my body is pretty much screaming at me to tell me that I am in fact not 18 anymore. So, uh, yeah, it's been uh, a little bit of a humbling experience, and maybe, just maybe, I need to uh, slow it down just a smidgen. But if it makes you feel any better, you just made mention about how uh, you try to get girls to like you and, and get them to laugh at you. 
Well, it definitely worked because you have a beautiful, beautiful uh, girlfriend there in Kirsty and someone that uh, very much like my wife puts up with a lot of wrestling that we watch. So uh, even yeah, though you did not make the even though you did not make the Olympic team, my friend, you're in a a okay spot because you have a wonderful girlfriend and you get to podcast with me about 11 times a week so uh it, take that it, as a positive i it, would my friend <laughs> it really does feel that way um <laughs> obviously we've got the marigold standard dropping as well this week um we as you mentioned we've got the dream star as well coming up which is uh just another thing that we are doing um which again is just absolutely ridiculous at the moment it does seem that that's all we're doing at the moment podcast we love it obviously um and as you mentioned you know we got um we got a nice shout out apparently on raw apparently uh but we also got a nice shout out from uh from sunny on uh on this latest corrigan hall show as well so it's always really nice to uh to hear your name your podcast read out on the show that you're reviewing it does uh it does make those uh that hard work worth it doesn't it yeah, one million percent. We wouldn't do it if we love it. And, uh, you know, I, I don't like the whole thing where somebody says that you deserve something, because in my opinion, mm. nobody in this world deserves anything. Everything is earned. And I know any credit that me and you have gotten uh, for this podcast and anything that we've done in our lives, both either, you know, as a team or individually, it's all been earned, my friend. It's all been earned. And uh, yeah, well, I mean, obviously, we put our heart into this and we, we absolutely love it. Oh, hell yeah, absolutely. Um, And I think we should probably get straight into it because, believe it or not, we've got about 845 things to go through. And I know that I start pretty much every podcast that we do by saying those words, but we genuinely have got a lot to cover today. We have got four different stardom shows. Um, the show from Nagata, which took place on Monday the 23rd, that isn't up on Stardom World at the time of recording, so we'll have to cover that next week. Um, when we preview um, Nagoya Golden Fight. Um, we have got the two shows from Aomori. We've got a show from Sendai and then the show from Kamina Yama that also included the Artists of Stardom Championship match. So we've got all that to go through. There's about 833 articles of news that I want to go into as well. We have got an Io and Kairi watch that I don't know about you guys, but I am absolutely buzzing for now. Um, uh, and Matt, that's without us talking about the Patreon. So why don't you enlighten our lovely listeners as to what's coming up on the Patreon this week? The Patreon, as usually every week, has been absolutely blitzing busy. So much great content that uh, we put out past, present, and future. Our alternate commentary is, in my opinion, the most underrated match in Stardom's history as we go back to the Midsummer Festival 2022 as Azumi takes on Momo Kogo for the High Speed Championship. Also, the What If with Trent Brewer, One Up Culture's Trent Brewer. We did What If You Can Change the Finish of Five Stardom Matches. And then we do have our roundtable discussion coming up sometime in the next week or so. Where myself and Rob Goodwin will be doing a roundtable discussion of our top five favorite high-speed uh, championship matches of all time. That and so, so much more. The, obviously, the tag team breakdown is in there. Uh, we did about two weeks ago with me and Andy Header, FWC versus uh, My Hemi. That's up there as well. As well as what show is better? What show did myself and Andy Header like better from the 22, it was basically the uh, 2019 Five Star Grand Prix Night One versus the 2020 Five Star Grand Prix Night One. So that is up on the Patreon feed as well. And just a little bit of a teaser for next week our October month, we'll be doing Gaijings in stardom. So the alternate commentary will be for the month of October. Myself and Rob will be doing the alternate commentary to five matches that have foreign wrestlers in there from stardom. And then our roundtable discussion, I just sealed the deal with Andy Hatter. Our roundtable discussion will be our top five favorite Gaijing matches that have taken place in stardom. So you have your Tony Storms, you have your Mariah Mays, you have your B Priestleys. A lot of great Gaijing wrestlers have come through stardom over the years, and uh, we've never done anything like this before. So that's basically what is coming up uh, on the month of September. And then coming up in the month of October, we will be celebrating foreign wrestlers in the land of stardom, my friend. So, yes, past, present, and future, so much great stuff on the Patreon feed. Yeah, and I think it's quite appropriate when you consider what we are going to be talking about a lot of 
today. Um, but just a brief shout out to all of our fantastic patrons. Just wanted to give you a huge shout out to say basically thank you for all of your support. Again, you guys are absolutely awesome, as is everyone that listens or spreads the word of the Stardom cast. We massively, massively appreciate every single one of you. Um, I can't wait for the Don Matsumoto and Chikusa Nagaya watch along to drop on Sunday as well, because that was just a wild ride and uh, if you think you've seen referee attacks wait until you've seen this match because legitimately I think Don Matsumoto is attempting to kill the referee and that is not one word of exaggeration Uh, with that being said let's talk about some news because goodness gracious me have we got some news to talk about you've already mentioned it Matt you've already talked about how you want to do a Gaikakujin month let's talk about the big news coming out of stardom today which i think might make this the first ever stardom cast where the news has dropped before we recorded which is uh which is quite good in my opinion um stardom are going to be running corican hall um on this weekend i believe it's on saturday followed by new blood 15 on the sunday the full cards have been announced including Tony Storm making her Corrigan Hall return, um, which, of course, is a prelude to her IWGP Women's Championship match against Mayu Iwatani, which is scheduled for the 5th of October in Nagoya. Um, the card is as follows. So we've got the Cosmic Angels, Natsupoi, Yunamiz, Mori, Anaya, Sakura, this the hate team of Konami, Rina, and Azusa, and Naba. Momokogo takes on Hanako in singles, action um we have got a three-way eight woman sorry a three-way 12 woman good grief um with the exv team of mika zina wak sukiyama and rian taking on the neo genesis team of suzu suzuki meisera starlight kid and the returning miyu amasaki we'll talk about that very shortly and the god's eye team of tomoka inaba hina lady c and rana yagami the hate team of Tam, I'm uh, sorry, no, the Cosmic Angels team of Tam Nakano, Sioriano, and Sayaka Karol will be taking on the hate team of Natsuko Tora, Sayaka Matani, and Ruaka. Tag team action. It's an all stars affair with Hazuki and Hanan taking on Saya Ida and Kogama. In your semi main event, that prelude tag team match, Mayu Iwatani and Azumi versus Tony Storm and Mina Shirakawa. And then in your main event, the Goddess of Stardom Championships are on the line. The champions, Momo Watanabe and Tekla, make their first title defense against the God's Eye team of Siri and Saki Kashima. So, Mac, Stardom are currently on the back of three consecutive 1,000-plus houses at Corrigan Hall. And I think this, we know that Tony Storm is a big star. I'm wondering if this is going to be an indicator of just how big a star she is. Are we going to see a big influx of fans coming into Corrigan Hall to see Tony Storm again for the first time since 2019? Or do you think it's going to be a case of this will be enough to maintain that 1,000 plus attendance? I think that they'll do probably around 1,300 people in there. You have to consider the fact that stardom's hot right now. And I always say you can like whatever wrestling company you like because wrestling's objective, but the numbers don't lie. You know, Every show that we've seen, especially from the five star on, these shows are jam packed. This one show we're going to review, the one that was on YouTube, they did over 100,000 streams within 24 hours. The product is hot right now. You have a really good storyline going on with this, but basically Orange Hazuki Cassidy, as I'm calling her, (laughs) because she's literally doing next to nothing and she's getting crazy over because she's building sympathy. And the fact that the fact that now we have her and Kagama, correct me if I'm wrong, partner, they're on opposite ends. In yep. this tag match, so you, you have a pretty, you know, it's, it, it, is it a cork and worthy card up until maybe those last three matches? Not really, but we've seen them kind of only give one or two big matches in cork and still be able to draw well over a thousand people. So, and again, it's stardom. I mean, the, the roster is absolutely loaded with talent. So you basically have all these matches that are going to build. I mean, I'm sure the matches will be good. All these matches that are going to build up. And then you're going to get that again further along the Hazuki storyline, which again, me 
and Rob when we did our alternate commentary this week. We don't know where it's going. We're pretty sure that it's going to end with Hazuki finally winning the Wonder of Stardom Championship, but it's the journey and the ride that we're all going on and the fact that the crowd is more behind Hazuki on these shows than they ever have been. And, folks, hazuki has been crazy over for the last few years. So um, you have that storyline. You have a championship match that's been built up really well in the main event with Momo and Tekla taking on Shuri and Saki Kashima, especially the fact that you know, partner, we're going to be getting some Momo and Shuri violence in that main event. And then, in fact, you have this dream tag match with Tony Storm teaming with Mina Shirakawa taking on Mayu versus Azumi. My guess is the fact that w- the reason why Azumi is in Mayu's team, Mayu's team and not Han or Hazuki or Kagama or another member of Stars is because Azumi is probably going to be next in line for an IWGP championship match. It looked like she was at the last pay-per-view at the uh, Namber Grand fight. It looked like she was going to challenge and then Tony Storm came up on the screen. So my guess, that's the reason why she's there. Regardless, I mean, look at the star power you have in this. Mayu, the biggest, you know, in my opinion, the greatest women's wrestler of all time on the run of her life. She's teaming with Azumi. Azumi is red, hot, or white hot at this point, whatever you want to call her. Not only is she part of a new faction in Neo Genesis, but what a five-star run she had. And then you have Mina Shirakawa, who's obviously uh, fantastic in every aspect. And the fact that she's been on AEW TV off and on these last few uh few months and then teaming with in my opinion the best women's wrestler in the history of the short history of AEW in Tony Storm not only that but it's Tony Storm former world of stardom champion former winner of the Cinderella tournament former winner of the five star grand prix coming back to a company that she absolutely loves I mean it's really exciting and again we thought this was just going to be a one off but as we said last week Tony Storm absolutely loves stardom she's not shy about her love for stardom and the fact that she's coming here to the stardom. My guess is she's going to be there the entire week because it wouldn't make sense, not unless AEW needs her, to fly her back and then have fly her back to Japan. My guess is that you're going to be seeing her doing press conferences. You're going to be seeing her doing promos. The fact that we get her on these two weekend shows and then next week the big match with Mayu, I think that just goes to show you how invested Tony Storm is to help stardom out here. And considering the fact that stardom is the hottest they've been in the past two or three years from a ticket sales and from having a buzz aspect. Again, folks, the numbers don't lie. You're putting... T- Tony Storm in this, my guess is that uh, you're going to do about 13, 1400 in Cork and Hall. Well, just to sort of look back at the Cork and Hall cars that they've run. So since July, we have had um, the 23rd of July, which was the Nighter show. That drew 1,017 people. We then had night four of the um, Five Star Grand Prix. That drew 1,400 and 60 people and then of course we had stardom in corican in september that drew 1022 people it wouldn't surprise me if we see a jump from 1022 up to around 1300 1400 people um you're absolutely right it's not a blistering card um although those final three matches do really really pique my interest especially that Hazuki and Hanan versus Sai Reader and Kagama, because we are going to be talking a lot about Hazuki during um, these four show reviews, and it's going to be really interesting to see how she um, conducts herself and how she acts around Kagama, especially as Kagama has gone very much through the seven stages of grief with Hazuki over these four shows, um, and it's been really, really compelling viewing. So, you know... Credit where credit is due. We saw that first backstage segment with Hazuki and thought that, oh my God, she's going to hate. That's it. And what they've done is they've made what we thought was a very predictable and sort of, oh God, I hope not, into a really compelling narrative. And something, again, which we're going to talk about a little bit later on, something that we don't see a tremendous amount of in uh, especially Japanese wrestling. So that's going to be really exciting to talk about. Just to talk about New Blood 15, which is going to be in the Japan Pavilion Hall in uh, Saitama. Um, We've also got a full card uh, for that as well, headlined by the Future of Stardom Championship match with Rina taking on Aya Sakura. Um, We have got Tomoka Inaba taking on Rian. 
Um, uh, Sayaka Karora taking on Soy from Evolution Wrestling. Lady C and Rani Yagami of God's Eye taking on the hate team of Ruaka and Azusa in Naba. Um, I apologize, I am going to butcher this name, but Hanako from EXV is going to be taking on a Chika Miyabi from PPP Tokyo. Um, he, no, buddy, you, 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 you said Hanako, right? Good thank job. you very much. You, you said it right. <laughs> I have been worried about that all day. Thank you so much. I needed that today. I've been wanting to call Haneko for years, but there we are. <laughs> <laughs> We've then got a special singles match. Hina of God's Eye taking on Miyawamasaki of Neo Genesis. Of course, they have passed uh, dealings in Queen's Quest before the whole Saya Kamatani thing and then that aforementioned Future of Stardom Championship match. Couple of interesting matches there again Matt it's one of those that again it's not the most um, captivating of New Blood cards however Tomoka Inaba versus Rian I think Rian's been doing some absolutely sterling work on these you know quote unquote Stardom World shows I'm excited by Hina and Miyu Amasaki. Hina's come on leaps and bounds, whilst Miyu Amasaki is benefiting hugely from being in Neo Genesis. And Aya Sakura, I don't think she dethrones Rina by any stretch of the imagination. And I actually want to talk a little bit about Aya Sakura's booking over these last four shows because it's been puzzling, to say the least. Um, but I think that's going to be a really, really, really good match. Because whenever these two have shared the ring, Rina and I, Sakura, they've always been very, very good together, Matt. Yeah, they did a good job building this match up. And correct me if I'm wrong, the Corkin show is Saturday and New Blood is Sunday, correct? Correct, yeah. Which is usually weird. Usually the New Blood show is kind of the appetizer to the big show in Corkin. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be interesting to see how they draw because I believe they advertised Tony Storm for the New Blood show as as well now whether that's an appearance or they set up a match at Corkin, that's a possibility as well so again she's over there um you know whether she decides that she at the end of her match my guess is that she's probably going to pin Izumi and then it's to build her up a little bit more for the Mayu or the old TLD it can go either way or Mina gets a win and she gets a future IWGP championship match again I don't know but my guess is I wouldn't be shocked that if Tony Storm in the timeless character basically says she was really impressed by you know uh somebody else that's not on the undercard or she adds herself to a match to make it either a three-way or a tag. But I know that the, the start of the, as of this morning, which again, shocking to everybody, including me and you big news dropped before we recorded. I wouldn't be shocked if there's a Tony storm challenge because she was advertised or is advertised for the new blood show. Yeah. Again, not the, the biggest of new blood cards, but a couple months ago, we made mention about how these new blood shows are doing like once a quarter or if that like once every four or five months and we're getting two almost within uh a few weeks of each other. So I like the consistency of it. And I like the fact that we're getting a, t a title shot as the main event uh, and a title title match. That's been built up pretty well uh, as well. So what are your thoughts? Obviously we'll do a more in depth preview next week before. Um, oh no, we won't. We won't at all. We'll review it next week. So I suppose this is our preview. Um, I'm assuming that you are in the same boat as me, that Ayasakura is not the one to dethrone Rena, which means that she will move on to 12, I believe, successful title defences in this absolutely gargantuan run. Who do you think then steps up to take the belt from Rena? Because, again, this is another show where we do have Azusa and Arbor on the card, but because Rena is both champions, you know, New Blood Tag and Future of Stardom champions, it means that we don't have a a New Blood Tag Team Championship title defense. Now, my question to you is, A, which one do you think she drops first? And B, who is that person that is going to be able to take the belt off Rena? Because at the moment, she has dismissed all comers. And looking at her record, you know, she has taken on Lady C, Wakasuki Yama, Azusa Inaba, Hanako, Yuzuki, Miyu Amasaki, Miran, Sayaka Karora, Nanami, Rani Yagami, and Hina. And then, of course, she's got Aya Sakura as well. That is a long, long list. Uh, you're asking me who's going to defeat 
uh, Rena to win that championship, it's got to be timeless Tony Storm. You know, she's new. <laughs> she's a future. She's she's never she's, she's never timeless. wrestled inside of. Yeah, she's timeless. Again, she goes back in time, and she's literally can say that she was on the first Stardom show, and or this is her first Stardom show. I would have thought the way that it was being built that I was going to win this championship, and then you, uh, without even noting, partner. Last week, you said that Hanako would be the perfect person to unseat her. And I was like, I think he's absolutely right. I wouldn't be shocked if Io wins again because of the fact that Rina has kind of done everything with this belt. It would be a cool little thing that for Aya, who's been getting a lot of steam as of late uh, in stardom, and especially with this little Tekla feud that they have going on where she's uh, basically stalking uh, Aya and Sayaka at the, at the merchandising table, which is pretty cool. So I wouldn't be shocked that maybe we got a little steam on Aya. She's been getting some big wins, uh, even though she lost to Ruwaka on one of these shows we're going to talk about, which made no sense, but uh, neither here nor there. So maybe Aya does win the belt, but I'm about 70% sure that Rina does retain, and then it's going to be Hanako the one to uh, to dethrone her, because I think right now, again, Rina has done enough with that championship belt mm-hmm. where it's kind of run its course, where now it's Hanako is kind of the new project that Stardom's working on and doing a great job. New look. She, again, she drank the Natsu Boy tonic water, where her hair grows five to six inches, <laughs> and uh, new finisher. She's been looking more devastating. Her and Mike as a tag team with that uh, suplex backbreaker spot that they did on one of these shows was oh, absolutely that was great. disgusting. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was gross, but like in a good way. Like you can tell they were being safe with it, but like from a kayfabe aspect, you're like, oh man, that's really cool. But my guess would be Hanako, and it's the perfect time because she's at that spot where we're putting more of a spotlight on her, and we want to sell more tickets to these new blood shows. So why not when if you add like a Tam or a Kamatani or whoever on these shows, why not, why not have Hanako? Uh, as your next champion. So I, to me, that would make all the sense in the world. But I wouldn't be shocked if Aya does pull off the win here. No. I, do I think that Aya Sakura has been built enough? I mean, it, my opinion is moot, really, because I thought that Hina was being groomed quite spectacularly to take the belt off Rina, and that was because I didn't realize. I thought that Rina had already broken the record, um, and actually the story was that Rina broke the record of her other sister against her other sister, which I thought was quite a nice narrative. Had I known that, I wouldn't have been so um, sort of entrenched in Hina taking the belt. I still think she should at some point, but maybe not here. However, I think Hanako has a lot more to gain now from being the champion than Rina. Rina's held it now at the time, recording 502 days, which is absolutely wild. It's one of the longest title reigns in stardom history of any belt, which, um, again, is truly, truly spectacular. Going back to the New Blood Tag Team Championships, obviously Oeritai, as they were then, hate now Rina and Azusa Inaba. They won the belts back on the 23rd of July and have not defended them since. That's 64 days at the time of recording without a title defense, which, you know, it's not unheard of when Bloody Fate held them. So Karma and Starlight Kid, they won the belts on the 25th of March and then didn't defend them until the middle of May. So, you know... It, they do have, you know, in their very short lineage, slightly longer to defend, you know, because of the lack of new blood shows or whatever you want to say. I don't like that, though. I, I want to see belts defended. And even though in my head, I feel like it was quite a short, a short term decision to put more belts onto hate. I imagine that was the thinking behind it. However, if you're not going to do anything with it, but you've still got Azusa and Arbor on these shows, I feel like it is a little bit of a waste. I don't know if that's just me. I might just be being uber negative for some reason. Maybe it's my broken ribs. Um, But I don't know if you feel the same. No, you got a point, and maybe the fact that we just want to see Rena and Azusa and Anabe wrestle more mm. because they're so good as a tag team. So yeah. that's a possibility. And again, they can do something we've seen in wrestling before. You know, back in the Ring of Honor days, Jay Lethal was the television champion and the heavyweight champion. And I think there was like two pay per views in a row where they started out with Jay Lethal TV title match and then they main event it with Jay Lethal heavyweight championship match. We haven't seen really stardom do that. That's something that they can kind of toy around with. Have you know if, if they're going to keep Arena with his championship belt? But again, I think it's going to be a matter of time before Hanako wins it. But at the same time, it is an experiment that they can do where they can have Rena wrestle maybe in the first match and then the last match. But ultimately, again, she has moved past this championship. In my opinion, she should be moving on to other things because she's such a great wrestler and 
really great character. And again, in a faction that has like 94,000 members, she really sticks out as kind of the cool heel and a, a heel that's really great at wrestling. So, um, yeah, again, and, and the fact that I think that her place right now in stardom is her and Azusa Nabe, not only as the new blood tag team champions, but hopefully, you know, come, we're going to find out in the next few, uh, week or two, we'll probably get some teams announced for the uh, Goddess of Stardom tag tournament. And I would love to see these two teams paired up in that tournament wrestling, the FWCs, wrestling the... You know, the crazy stars wrestling the um the, the peach thunder wrestling uh wing gory i mean there's a lot of really cool interesting matchups wrestling maybe suzu or excuse me tomoka and sherry if that's the way they go but uh yeah i would like to see rena and azusa more as a tag team more frequently on these shows yeah agreed agreed um uh, obviously one of those teams that hopefully would be a part of the tag league is o2 line um, unfortunately, Miyu Amasaki um, was forced to miss shows in Yamagata and Nagata. So the show on the 22nd and the show on the 23rd, it was announced actually through Walker Stewart, who tweeted it out, um, that unfortunately Miyu Amasaki would not be in attendance at those two events due to the dreaded poor health. There's been no elaboration on that, but of course she has been announced for the New Blood and Corrigan Hall shows coming up. So fingers crossed it was just a precaution more than anything else. That absence necessitated a couple of card changes, um, uh, basically on the day, uh, with the Yamagata show already being uh, privy to a couple of changes, which uh, I'll get into in a second. Um, but that show, it was initially supposed to be Miyu Amasaki and Ra- uh, versus Rani Yagami and Azumi versus Kagame versus Zena. That was changed to Azumi and Zena versus Kagame and Rani Yagami. And the show from Monday, in Nagata, which of course isn't up on Stardom World yet, so we won't be reviewing. That was initially supposed to be Kagama versus Hanako versus Ruaka, Hina and Ran Yagami versus Meisera and Miyu Amasaki, Mayu, Hazuki, Kagama, Hanan, and Momokogo versus Mika, Mina Shirakawa, Zina, and Waka Sukiyama. Um, and then Siori Saki, Kashima, and Lady C versus Konami, Tekka, and Momo Watanabe. Obviously, that needed to be changed because of Miyu's injury. So that got changed to Hina versus Meisera. The stars team of Mayu Iwatani, Hazuki, Kagama, Momo, Kogo, and Hanan versus Mika, Mina, Shirakawa, Zeno, Waka, Sukiyama, and Hanako. And then God's Eye, Siori Saki, Kashima, Lady C, and Rani Yagami versus the hate team of Momo Watanabe, Tekla, Konami, and Ruwaka. Again, Matt, I am assuming that it is just precautionary or something minor. Obviously, we saw uh, Mayu and we saw Tekla missing the two Amori shows um, from Wednesday and Thursday. Um, Mayu to get a bit of treatment for injury. We saw her at Takaira Pratcher on her Instagram story. Um, still not entirely sure why Tekla missed um, the shows. I know she's got her finger in thousands of other pies with music and art and stuff. So it could have been that. Hopefully, if it was an injury, it's not too serious. She was back in action in Sendai. Fingers crossed it is something similar for Miyu Amasaki, more precautionary than anything else. Yeah, again, you want to take your precautions with this. You don't want to linger any injuries and then pushing them out there in shows and even furthering, you know, getting injured. And then they're instead of being out a weekend, now they're out a month or two months or three months. Again, with the stardom roster being as stacked as it is with a lot of different angles going on, you can afford for these wrestlers to miss a weekend or miss two or three shows. Again, Mayu is the biggest star and she missed two of these shows we're going to talk about. And they were still great shows and they still were, were, were jam packed. So yeah. And we've seen this with stardom over the last year or so, considering the fact of how many injuries just built up last year, the fact that again, if somebody is injured, have them take time off. If somebody is sick, you know, send them home so they're not getting anybody else. Like again, we live in a post-COVID world. So it sounds like this is just precautionary. You know, hopefully whatever injury it is that she's able to heal. And if she needs more time off, let her take more time off to heal up and then get her back in the mix when she's closer to a hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. And again, she has been pardon me, announced for this weekend's shows. So it doesn't sound like anything too serious. Um, In this new era of stardom, the post-Rossi stardom, something that has been very, very noticeable 
is the amount of stardom wrestlers wrestling outside stardom. And over this week, we have had an absolute slew of news in regards to wrestlers wrestling outside stardom. So first to drop was Azumi making her UK debut. Um, she will be coming to England. She's been announced for RevPro's Global Wars UK show in October in Doncaster, just an hour or so away from me. She's going to join Mina Shirakawa at that show. She will be taking on Kanji in a special singles match. Mina Shirakawa, of course, has already been announced for that card and will be defending her undisputed British Women's Championship. So that is going to be very, very, very exciting. Kanji is great. Azumi, world-class, of course. I imagine she's going to get quite the reception from the UK crowd, man. Yeah, again, stardom wrestlers are all over the place, and maybe... And again, this is going to be a conversation for another day that, again, we've seen the attendance go up quite a bit this year, especially the fact that no Julia, no Tommy. Uh, Mina's been absent at some of these shows because she's been either over in England or over in AEW. So maybe this is one of the reasons why the attendance has gone up. And again, this is a, another, conversa- another conversation for another day that I'd love to have with you someday, partner. But because of the fact that stardom wrestlers are wrestling outside of the stardom bubble, whether it's in England, whether it's in Sendai Girls, whether it's in the Catch the Wave, whether it's in AEW, whether it's in the New Japan Strong Shows, that's a possibility. So now we have Azumi, who's somebody that is uh, loved everywhere that she goes, going over to the UK, wrestling over there. Partner, is that a show that you're going to be by chance going? Because I don't know how far away that is from you. But uh, I'm just wondering, considering the fact that you're still mad at me, that I didn't take the 27 hour trip to see Hanako <laughs> at the New Japan Academy. So I just have to volley I have to volley the question back, my friend. Oh, uh, um well, that that does depend. Unfortunately, I am actually in Barcelona that week um uh, due to being on a school trip. So that does depend on the ribs. If the ribs are still not great, then I won't be going to that. Um and then perhaps I would be going to the Doncaster Dome. However, the chances are no, because Barcelona is a little bit of a trek, and I don't think they would let me come home a day early because Azumi and Mina Shirakawa are wrestling in England. I just don't think they'd understand, Matt. You know, some people just don't have the stardom priorities right like me and you do, buddy. But hey, you know, not everybody's like us, and... uh... I don't know. That could be a good thing, though. I was just going to say that. I don't <laughs> think that's a bad thing, mate, at all. Uh... <laughs> yeah, we're two horses of a different color. That's for sure, brother. But we own it. God damn it, do we own it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, moving on then, talking about some Sendai girls action, Momo Watanabe and Ruaka. Momo, who is... Uh, this isn't the first or last time we are going to be talking about Momo today. Um, she will be featured on the Sendai girls show on September 27th in Shinjuku Face. They will be in a tag team match against the Raiwa Ultima Powers, and that is the team of Dash Chisako and Hiroyu Matsumoto, who wrestled over 140 times for Stardom. She is a previous artist of Stardom Champion, previous goddess of Stardom Champion, alongside Jungle Kiona. So, uh, <coughs> just a cough there um really really good wrestler really excited to see that and obviously momo watanabe and dash chisako have a lot more recent history having just had that hardcore match in july on zendai girls corican hall show this will be however um ruaka's first time in a sendai girls ring since 2017 and that was only when she took part in a five minute dark exhibition match against Manami of all people, Matt. So uh, there you go. Excited to see that match. Yeah, Momo Watanabe was got over huge in that match with Dash, uh, that hardcore match uh, from Sendai Girls a few months ago. So it's nice to see her coming back and a tag form and bringing Ruwaka with her. Again, Ruwaka is somebody, one of the younger wrestlers that's kind of on the bottom of the card. So I think it's going to be really, really cool to see uh, Ruwaka outside of stardom, you know, getting her name out there even more. And again, against somebody that's kind of a legend over there uh, in stardom, you mentioned, you know, the accolades, a former goddess champion, former artist champion. I believe that she was uh, in the finals of, I believe, the 2016 five-star Grand Prix, the one that um, the one that uh, Mayu Yutani won. I, I believe I could have that right. I could have that wrong. But, uh, yeah, again, interesting. More Sendai Girls action 
for the Stardom wrestlers. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one of the huge things for me about this uh, this seeming open door policy that Stardom have at the moment is it's only going to benefit the wrestlers and seeing the likes of a Hanako go on a US excursion, seeing the likes of Ruaka go out to different places, the likes of Ayasakura, who has just been a part of the Catch the Wave tag tournaments, the Dual Shock tournaments. I don't know if that's still going on, but I know that she's been a part of that. She's also going to be a part of a Sendai Girls tournament starting in October, which we're going to talk about in a moment. We saw, obviously, Rani Yagami go over to Catch the Wave tournament as well it's re- it's really really benefiting these wrestlers on the lower undercard that giving them more reps giving them sort of a chance to wrestle different people in different environments and i think it's only going to be beneficial to them this is going to be great anyway because we saw what dash and momo can do hiroi matsumoto is absolutely tremendous and um, i've seen ruaka have some really 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 good matches when motivated and i think the perfect example of that is where her and natsu katora took on nanae takahashi and you in the main event at korokan hall and ruaka got a standing ovation at the end of that match so if we get that ruaka as opposed to you know the sort of formulaic crate wielding ruaka we sometimes get I think this could have real, real potential. Um, just speaking of Sendai girls, very briefly, um, Mikuri Wata versus um, Sayori Ano from the 13th of September, that rematch for the Sendai Girls World Championship. That is now up on Stardom World for those who don't have Wrestle Universe. So if you haven't checked that out yet, you can now. Um, the same goes for the Sariism Chapter 4 main event which was Sari and Azu sorry Sari and Natsupoi taking on Azumi and Takumi Aroha. So if you haven't seen that, that is up on Stardom World as well. Really good transition and turnaround from the Stardom World team. Um speaking of Momo Watanabe, she's gonna be cropping up in Diana as well um on the 13th of October. Diana will be returning to Corican Hall for the first time since April. Um, and both Momo Watanabe and Rina will be on that card. Rina will be teaming with Hanoka uh, versus a legendary Jaguar, Yokota, and Nanami. There's some interesting history there, which we're going to talk about in a moment. And then in the main event, Momo Watanabe will be taking on Haruka Umasaki as well. Now, the last time. Diana were in Corican Hall. It was the 29th of April, and Haruka Umasaki was defending her World Woman Pro Wrestling Diana Championship match against another stardom wrestler. Can you tell me who that stardom wrestler was? Was it May Sarah? It was indeed May Sarah. Now, obviously, unfortunately, Haruka Umasaki is no longer the champion. I believe Mike Rosaki is the uh, is the current champion but it will not be for the title however i have no doubt that that will be absolutely tremendous this show will also see the diana return of Aja kong to the company for the first time since june she's going to be teaming with himiko against the team of tehoma and miyuki takase um no um indication as to how you can watch that yet but as soon as we know something uh, we will t- we will relay that information for you um obviously i talked a little bit about the history between rena and nanami um rena has been in diana just once before she was in a tag team match and that went to a no contest it also included risa sarah and moran um so that went to a no contest that set up the nanami and rena match for the future of stardom championship that took place at the stardom corrigan hall show which went to a time limit draw so are we going to see another challenge from nanami maybe maybe it's her that dethrones rena after all rena hasn't beaten her what turn what do you think that's a possibility but if you go back to hanan versus tomoka inaba that went to the old tld and unfortunately they never ran it back. However, uh, it's a possibility. I mean, the match is there, but you also can run if they do go with Hanako winning the future of Stardom Championship that we made mention that's that we both think is going to happen. You can make you can run uh, 
uh, Manami versus Hanako as like one of your first defenses, like your V1. And you know, that match would be an absolute banger barn burner of a match. And what a great way it would be. That's the way they go to start off Hanako's championship reign as the future of stardom champion. But yeah, there's a lot of different ways they can go. A lot of paths. A lot of them make sense. Um, Again, you know, going back just two minutes ago with Haruka uh, Yamasaki versus Momo Watanabe. I mean, that's going to be a terrific match. My guess is if it's not going to be any sort of VOD, probably about a week or two after the match has aired, we'll probably see it on Stardom World. As we're seeing the Sariism shows that that have the Stardom wrestlers on Stardom World, as well as the Sengai Girls stuff as well. So, again, a great job on uh, the Stardom Booking Committee getting more of these wrestlers wrestling outside of the Stardom bubble to get more eyes on the product. So a uh, really good stuff coming down the way, not only in stardom, but the stardom wrestlers wrestling literally all over the world for different wrestling companies. And that being said, final one to talk about is that two stardom wrestlers have been announced for Sendai girls, Jaja Uma tournament. I don't know whether it's Yaya Uma or Jaja Uma. I'm really sorry. I didn't know until a couple of days ago that this tournament actually existed. But Aya Sakura and Rian have both been announced for the tournament, which begins in April. It's a tournament that is aimed at rookies or with anyone with under three years of in ring experience. Um, this will be the sixth iteration of the tournament zones won the 2023 tournament. She defeated Yora Suzaki in the final in Shinjuku face at the start of this year. Um, uh, the other names announced are Rian Ayasakura, as I mentioned, Soi, Yuna, Chichi, Honoka, Yuzuki, not that one, Mizuki Kato, Maria Kuga, and Spike Nishimura. Um, three dates have been announced. The first round of matches will take place at Shinkiba First Ring on the 3rd of October. The second round will take place at Sendai Pit on the 18th of October with the finals taking place at Shinkiba on the 20th of October. Rian begins her tournament against Spike Nishimura whilst Aya Sakura will take on the winner of Soi and Yuzuki and she will be in action on the 18th of October. Um, Just to give you some indication, previous winners of the tournament include Haruka Rumasaki, former New Blood Tag Team Champion as a Rolter Ego Karma, and also High Speed Champion May Sailor while she was still going by May Hoshizuki. But Matt, if this tournament can do half of what the Catch the Wave tournament has done for Rani Yagami, I'm very excited to see how these two girls go on. Yeah, I was just thinking about how well Ron Yugami did in the Catch the Wave tournament. And again, if you subscribe to Stardom World and haven't seen those, they are on there as well as Saya Kamatani's run in the Catch the Wave tournament uh, from earlier this year. But yeah, I, again, I was thinking of the same thing, the, how great Rana came out of that tournament and then got herself basically a berth due to Ami Sori's uh, injury, got, a, got herself uh, into the five-star Grand Prix. This tournament can do the exact same thing for I. Sakura and Rian. So we've been singing their praises, you know, the last few months of how what how much they have improved and considering the fact that both these wrestlers are still relatively rookies, very much young into their professional wrestling careers, and that they're able to uh, just do better each and every outing, each and every week, each and every show. And the fact that we have a wrestling tournament named after a Star Wars uh, wrestler, the Jar Jar Banks <laughs> tournament. Uh, I, I mean, folks, you have Star Wars, wrestling. I mean, Joshi, I mean... Again, you thought I was excited about a half an hour ago when we started this podcast. I'm even more excited now that Jar Jar Binks tournament for Sendai Girls. <laughs> terrific. Terrific. I think that stardom should do the uh, Luke Skywalker, uh, you know, uh, Jedi Apprentice uh, tournament. So, uh, but uh, no, all, all joking aside, all kidding aside, folks, we like to have fun on the show. But no, this is going to be a great opportunity for two young wrestlers that have been doing fantastic work in the stardom ring to kind of spread their wings and do other work for other wrestling companies. So good on them. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Um, That just about wraps up the amount of wrestlers that are wrestling for different companies just this week. Um, So um, I imagine we're going to get another slew of wrestlers uh, next week that are going to be wrestling around the world. Um, Let's move on then to the four different shows 
that we have got to review. We're going to start in Aomori uh, with the Aomori Two Days in Aomori show from Wednesday the 18th of September. 351 people in attendance in the show on Wednesday at Aomori Industrial Hall. Um, uh, this first time, I believe, that Stardom have run the venue, at least this year anyway. Um, so a decent enough attendance. Just a little bit of a recap. My way with Tani will miss these first two shows, as will Tekla, although Tekla's is unspecified as to why. The results for this show are as follows. Follows. In singles action, Mina Shirakawa defeated Rian with the figure four leg lock in 10 minutes and 41 seconds. In a three way match, Saki Kashima, who was the low key MVP of these run of shows because of her just general demeanor in these three way matches, I thought she was great. She defeated Mika and Sayaka Karora here with a flying head scissors in six minutes and 57 seconds. In the singles match, Riwaka defeated Aya Sakura with the choke bomb in eight minutes and 20 seconds. Six woman tag action. EXV, Hanako Zina, and Wakasukiyama defeated the God's Eye team of Shuri, Lady C, and Rani Yagami. Hanako submitting Rani Yagami with the Shirasagi in 10 minutes and 51 seconds. In your semi main event, the 10 woman tag match Neo Genesis, Starlight Kid, Azumi, Miyu Amasaki, Suzu Suzuki, and Meisera defeating the Stars team of Hazuki Kogama, Momo Kogo, Saya Ida, and Hanan um, with Suzu Suzuki getting the pinfall over Saya Ida with the tequila shot in 12 minutes and 52 seconds. And then in your main event, eight-woman tag action, the hate team of Natsu Katora, Saya Kamatani, Momo Watanabe, and Rina defeated the Cosmic Angels team of Tam Nakano, Natsupoi, Seoriano, and Yuna Mizumori with Saya Kamatani pinning Seoriano with the Frankensteiner in 13 minutes and 46 seconds. Lots of things to talk about here, Matt. Um... Something that I'm interested in, and this is something that's going to crop up a couple of times, and this isn't a criticism by any stretch of the imagination. It's it's a genuine, it's a genuine thought process because having never been in the wrestling business, having never booked in the wrestling business, having never been exposed to the wrestling business from a business standpoint, how do you tread the line between building a challenger? but making your champion look weak. Obviously, as a booker, it's a rather rather unenviable task, isn't it, where you're trying to build your your challenger, in this case, Aya Sakura, to be a credible threat to Rina, who has been a dominant champion. We've seen Aya Sakura get two successful pinfalls over Rina with the schoolboy and then, of course, the triangle choke as well. Yet here, she loses to Ruaka, in eight minutes. And then she loses to Sayurida in a couple of shows time. And then in Nagata, she loses in a multi-woman. Now, those are the three matches leading into her title shot with the exception of Corrigan Hall. Do you think that she could have been booked stronger? Or do you think that's just the way it is? A hundred percent, she could have been looked to book stronger. I mean, obviously the Saida match, she looked really good on Saida. I do gave agree. Another rest. I do agree that Saida, Saida wins that match. Yes, I agree because in just in terms of Stardom Totem Pole, Saida is higher than Aya Sakura. I do agree with that. Especially coming off the star making performance that Saida had, and we knew she was going to have coming out of that five star. You know, Agreed. We, we talked about it. We were so excited for her to get that on opportunity loaded in that block that she was in she is she's fantastic uh, absolutely fantastic so i got no problem with that the multi-person one you could have went about a different way but i'm kind of you know i'm not losing sleep over any of that mm. the one that kind of i'm really scratching my head about is this ruwaka one exactly it's like Ru- ruwaka is in the same faction mm-hmm. as rena it was actually ruwaka who accidentally hit rena with the uh the dumb crate that we hate so much that actually caused isa core to get the win thus planting the seed and earning her this championship opportunity. But then why does Ruaka go over Aya Sakura here? I mean, the only logical sense to me as someone that kind of seeing wrestling from the other side of the curtain would be if Aya gets the win and wins the championship and then Ruaka is the first challenger where she comes out and basically says, hey, you know, you did defeat uh, Rina. You know, uh, we're in the same faction, but I beat you. 
about a week or so earlier, I want to be the first challenger. That's the only way that I can go about it that would make sense to me. But to me, the booking on this doesn't make sense whatsoever. There's no reason why Ayas Akor couldn't have gotten a win over Ruwaki here on match three on a show that was on a Wednesday. Like, you kind of need to build a little bit more steam. And then correct me if I'm wrong, the way that it's listed, I is in the main event of that New Blood show, correct? Correct. So you want to get more steam behind her to kind of sell more tickets to build the intrigue up that you may see a title change to be able to get more tickets sold for that show. But the the... The other ones, whatever, especially the Saito one, I completely understand. Actually, Isakor looked really good in that match, even though coming up, even though she was she was eating the L. That just goes to show you how well that Saito was able to build up I in that match, and it made Saito look like even a better performer than we already know that she is. But for her to lose to Ruwaki here, to me, that didn't make any sense. There's no reason why she couldn't have gotten the win with that head kick triangle, uh, that triangle choke combination that she's been doing and doing all so well, my friend. But yeah, I just I totally. I totally agree with you. No reason why I couldn't have got the win here on against Ruaka. And I think as well as the way that she lost as well, because as you mentioned, you know, the match against Sai Reader, I thought she put in a tremendous performance. You know, the chops versus the kicks and her, the resilience that was shown, I think was a really, really good indication of where we're going with the Aya Sakura character. But here she got beaten pillar to post for the vast majority of this match. Ruaka dominated her save for a very brief pocket of offense. And yeah, I know that Tora distracts the ref and Ruaki uses the crate and hits the choke bomb, but you can't deny that it does put an enormous dent into her momentum heading towards the future of Stardom Championship match. And I think because it was such a nothing match, you know, it was a throwaway singles match in the middle of a Stardom World show, no one's going to remember if Ruaka loses. However, people are going to remember that Aya Sakura was able to build this momentum ahead of a championship challenge. And that, in my opinion, was what Stardom did so well with Hina during the five-star Grand Prix tour. I think they booked her perfectly as a legit challenger to Rina. I just think there was a couple of missteps. Again, completely agree with the Sayurida match, not only because of Sayurida being higher on the stardom totem pole, but also because of how Aya Sakura would look. I I wouldn't necessarily mind the defeat here for Aya Sakura had she put up more of a fight against Ruaka, but again, you know, for three quarters of this eight minute match, it felt like Ruaka was pretty much dominating Aya Sakura and to me, it was a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a little bit of a head scratcher. But there we are. Um, uh, Mina versus Rian. Rian is the success story of this run of four shows, you know, and that's not even counting her performances at Namba Grand Fight against Xena and the New Blood Show West team with Micah in the main event. I think she has done really, really good work. Yes, she lost to Mina, but this is yet another indication of it's not how you lose. Sorry, it's not if you lose, it's how you lose. It's a great example of just how far she's come. Um, She has a great back and forth with Mina, and basically the only thing that stops her winning is that she's physically incapable of withstanding the level of damage to her leg. And because that's the story throughout the match, it makes sense. Um... All of this, of course, because she's just had Xena, she had Mina today, and then she's got Micah the following day. It did feel almost like a final initiation before being allowed into EXV, but I think she did a very, very good job here. Helped, of course, by Mina taking the time to uh, to put over Rian in her post-match interview. Yeah, considering the fact that this one, you know, you give 11 minutes, to basically let's see what you can do and any mishaps that Rianne would have in this match, which again, she's only been wrestling five or six months. It's going to happen to people that are wrestling five, six years. You know, we see it all the time. But any mishaps that she may have in this match, Mina's going to be able to cover because Mina is so good and she's such a pro. And she takes Rianne, again, somebody that we've been really impressed with these last few weeks and makes her look even better. She does a great job in that. And ultimately, then eventually she becomes a member of the faction that uh, Mina is in. So again, it's a win-win here for me 
you know, it makes perfect sense for me to, to make Rianne look really, really good here, make her look really strong. And ultimately, it's just the legwork and the figure four that does the young rookie in. But yeah, obviously, credit to Rianne here. Looked terrific in this match. And Mina does a great job of pulling somebody up to make her look even better. So kudos to both these wrestlers. I actually had a three and a half stars, and I thought it was a really solid way to start uh, these run of shows, brother. Yeah, I gave it three and a quarter for that exact reason. I think to be given that amount of time to open the show, and I know we're in her home prefecture, but I think that's a real sort of uh, feather in the cap for Rian because they clearly have quite a lot of faith in her. And the development of her, the speed of which she's developing now is really good. She's, you know, sort of developing those characters, able to tell those stories, um, you know, really good on offense, really good on defense. She had some really good exchanges, actually, with uh, with Mayu and Sendai as well. So really good, positive things on the horizon for the pair, as uh, the Stardom website knows her as, which is a great nickname. Not quite the violent freezer, but uh, but still quite good. Uh, before we get into the main event and the semi-main event, Matt, um, is there anything you want to talk about um, from these first four matches? I just want to talk about match number four. It was a good match, three and a half stars, don't get me wrong, but I just want to talk about the uh, psychopath that is Sherry. The fact that how she gets Ronnie Yagami and Lady ADC fired up for this match. She has to back chop her two uh, her two partners, mm-hmm. and then Zena basically does in kind does the same thing. It was like, well, if Sherry's going to do some back chops. I'm going to back chop Hanako and Waka. Now, Rob, let me tell you for some for something for someone that's been wrestling about half their lifetime. Chops, I don't mind. They sting. They make a cool noise. You get a big pop. They look really cool. You know, after the match, when you have a bruise on your chest, as you know, I was able to chop you in uh, Philadelphia, and you probably have another one coming in Vegas. Just- <laughs> <laughs> Just FYI. But let me tell you something about back chops. They suck. They are terrible. And I've been chopped and hit by some very, very uh, hard-hitting wrestling opponents. I don't know if I've ever been chopped by somebody like a Shuri or a Xena. So the fact that these two wrestlers decided to back chop, not only back chop, but back chop their own tag partners to start the match just goes to show you how insane these two wrestlers are. Uh, all in all, though, great match. Again, this match was the highlight. Hanako here, who looked to look really good. Three and a half stars for me. But, uh, yeah, the main crux of these uh, this show was definitely the semi-main event and the main event partner. Yeah, what I really liked about that match that you've just talked about is the way that Hanako deadlifts Rani Yagami into that Shirasagi. It just makes that move look so much more brutal. And I know that obviously she can't do that with every opponent, but it it just looked really, really vicious. And that sort of that additional sort of razor razor's edge of Hanako's character, this sort of badass that she's portraying um really really big fan of that i gave it three and a quarter really enjoyed it now the biggest question at least on my mind coming out of number grand fight was how hazuki was going to react to her sixth straight unsuccessful attempt at the wonder of stardom championship and you know would it be anger would it be ferocity would we get a turn would she be you know would she have this renewed desire to prove herself and the answer is rather shocking as she is just existing you know it's it's a real stark contrast to the hazuki who we you know no days off hazuki is what we call her on the podcast and we call that for a reason because she wrestles every match as though it's a title match and that's what makes her so damn good but to see just all of the wind knocked out of her and to see her just directionless, listless in the ring, you know, no desire to be there whatsoever is actually quite jarring. Um, But credit where credit is due. And this was the thing that I wanted to talk about. I don't think enough people in Japanese wrestling care when they've lost a title match. Like, you know, you could be upset after a title match in the ring, you're doing your promo, you get upset, and then the next week you come out and you're absolutely fine. And that's the case for a lot of wrestlers, and you don't see those long-lasting effects. Now, obviously, there are exceptions to that rule. Tetsuya Naito, for example, being one of them, you know, in the long-term storytelling. However, here, this is perfect, because we've talked about the fact that she has, you know, 
the largest active losing streak in terms of the white belt, in terms of singles championships, now that Starlight Kid finally won the high-speed title. The fact that there is such a stark difference, the fact that this has been the thing, the fact that she hasn't turned, it would be the perfect thing. I would say the perfect thing, but it it would be almost justifiable for her to turn heel and say something needs to change. But I'm actually a huge fan of the fact that Stardom haven't done the easy thing here. They've actually played on the fact that this means something to Hazuki. It's not just a match. It's not just a match that she's had and she's forgotten now. Like, she went full into this, hood up, refused to do the stars sign, uh, refused to be involved in the match until Kagama physically dragged her into it, refused to say things backstage. She was off social media. The entire thing, it ju- there wasn't like a, just a void in all of the stars' matches, and it felt really, really real. And what added to it, was the fact that every single post-match promo that Stars did after these multi-women, everyone was different. Hazuki was the same, but the reactions of your Kogamas, your Momokogos, your Hanans, your Sayuridas, and then later on Mayu, every single time it was something different, and that added to this story. I think it's honestly, I don't think she should turn after this. I think this should be a case of, right, Hazuki needs to find herself. She needs to rekindle that fire, and then she needs to go after that white belt one final time, and that's where she gets it. That's where we get that huge pop. And you you said it perfectly on the alternate commentary this week. She's going to get far more of a, of a reaction as a baby face with the stars people all around her because we saw in some of these post-matches just how much A, Hazuki means to them and B, how much Hazuki's pursuit of the white belt means to her as well. You know, having them around her as well as she holds that white belt up, you can't tell me when they run All-Star Grand Queendom in April next year having Hazuki hold that white belt up for the first time, having been wrestling for it since 2016, that is going to be such an incredible moment. And the if they are going to do that long-term storytelling, I think they've done it perfectly. And then you pair her up with Starlight Kid, perhaps the only other person in the company who can sympathize with where Hazuki is. Hazuki, I get it. I was 0-7 for the high-speed championship. I thought it would never happen. I physically went to a wedder tie because that was what it did to me. And I think that's really exciting as well, the fact that we are bringing in other characters to this storyline. I mean, don't get me wrong, all of the Stars multi-women matches are great because they have absolutely tremendous chemistry. Arguably, at least for me, the most chemistry on this entire roster when it comes to multi-women tags but that plays second fiddle because all we're doing is watching for how Hazuki is and how it's impacting the people around her because stars get overrun in every single match that they have in this run of four shows because Hazuki will tag out and just leave. Uh, she's seen on the stairs at Sendai Pitch. She just literally wandered off through one of the doors in uh, Hashinoe. Like, she's done, completely done. And watching stars get overrun and Hazuki not being there to make the save, brilliant storytelling. Brilliant storytelling. I don't want her to go to hate, not because I don't think a heel turn will be justified, but because I think this is a far more interesting story. Brother, you talked a lot of great, great stuff. There are a lot of great points that uh, I'm going to add on. But yeah, I mean, you look at Hazuki, we all can sympathize with her. We've all been there where we've tried to, you know, became close to winning a championship or didn't get that raise or didn't get that promotion where you're just kind of told, no, you weren't good enough or you're not ready for it at this time where you don't want to talk to anybody. You want to shut the world out. And like you feel bad. It's heartbreak. It's heartbreak for Hazuki. It really, really is to the point where it's just like, not only that, but she's feeling sorry for herself. Where the first like two shows, it was like, okay, you know, Hazuki, we'll finally rally and we'll get into it. And then we'll get into it. And then when we talk about these uh, these last two shows, now Kagan was like, all right, snap out of it. And physically assaulted Hazuki, not assaulted, but forearmed Hazuki. He's like, hey, snap out of it. 
And yes, because the wonder of stardom championship means so much to Hazuki. Again, I mentioned it. Uh, I mentioned it all the, the time that post our, uh, uh, the press con- the pre- press conference match she had with Saya Kamatani for last year's, uh, world of wonder of stardom championship match. She said that she came back to stardom, came out of retirement to win the wonder of stardom championship. And you mentioned how all of stars are rallying behind Hazuki, go back and watch that match with Saya Kamatani for two different reasons. One, in my opinion, I know you agree with me, partner. It's the greatest wonder of stardom championship match of all time. And two, when Hazuki goes to the ring, she has new music, she has a new outfit, and every single member of Stars is out there holding the ropes open for her. There's like six members of Stars that are there to support Hazuki before she even gets into the ring. You're like, they're really try- trying to rally behind Hazuki. Um, I don't think she's going to go to hate. As much, and I know you were a little worried about it when we closed out the show last week because of the interviews uh, that they were that they literally just posted as we were getting to wrap wrap up the show last week. I think one of the reasons why she's not going to go to, I mean, it could work because we've seen Hazuki as a heel as part of a wedding tie. She was absolutely fantastic, um, but it means more to stars, to Hazuki, to the company, to her fans, i.e., me and you and everybody else, because again, she's the people's champion to win that championship as a face as a member of stars but i think the interesting story because now we're adding layers right because we have to do something she's not going to win that belt in a month or two months we need to build hazuki back up so now we're going to add layers into the storytelling this show these four shows that we're going to review to me it's building towards a starlight kid and hazuki program hopefully fingers crossed we get a singles match or some sort of tag match coming up in nagoya at the pay-per-view next week because that would just add on to what our is already looking as a spectacular spectacular card but my guess would be hazuki's looking to maybe go into hate maybe do the heel turn where starlight kid would be like hey i was down that path and i walked that road for a few years and it's not the road you want to walk down because it's going to lead to heartbreak because that's what happened to me, and that's what's going to happen to you. After they used me, they got rid of me, and they're going to do the same thing to you. Maybe it looks like Hazuki's going to turn, but it's Starlight Kid in these series of matches. First of all, who doesn't want to see a series of matches of Hazuki versus Starlight Kid, whether they're singles or tags? Everybody wants to see that. Well, what a great storyline it would be if it's in these series of matches with Starlight Kid versus Hazuki, where it's just like Starlight Kid basically t- tells her, like, don't go down that path. Keep continuing down the path that you're on, because you will eventually get there. Now, Saboy told you right after she beat you, don't give up. You'll eventually get there. I'm telling you, because you just said, partner, that I was 0-7, right, for the high-speed championship. Eventually, I got there. Eventually, you will get there. Don't go, don't go to the dark side, as we're going to reference another Star Wars reference. Don't go Sith. Stay Jedi. Um, and I think that's eventually going to be the long-term story that they're going to go with Hazuki. Really, and I know things change. But it really, really seems like this is a longer-term storyline to get Hazuki eventually to the Wonder of Stardom Championship. As I mentioned last week, I know you were very heartbroken when uh, you had to review that fantastic match she had with Natsupoi that I told you was going to be all right because eventually they're going to build Hazuki back up. Really looks like over these four shows, that's what they did. And not only that, it gives Natsupoi time to breathe. It gives her time to establish her reign as Wonder of Stardom Championship champion. So you're getting really the best of both worlds. And then eventually, when the time is right, they're going to pair. Now, in my opinion, I think this is what they're going to do. They're going to pair Hazuki and Natsupoi back up. And then Hazuki is going to get the big, big win, which we will all rejoice. And I will more than likely cry in my living room at 5 in the morning because that's what this stardom company does to me, my friend. But ultimately, this is a great, great story they're doing with Hazuki because she's literally doing next to nothing in these matches, which, one, you're getting more sympathy on her. And, two, it gives Hazuki, even though she's in the ring, taking a few bumps – to give her time to rest her body a little because instead of doing the suicide dives and the brain busters and taking all these insane bumps, she's really doing very little. So you're getting her time to rest her body. And not only you're getting the Hazuki character over, but you're getting everybody else over. Kagama now is just like, wow, this is amazing. Momo Kogo, Hana, they're all trying to rally behind her. Where does Mayu stand on this? Because she was away for most of these shows. She's the leader of stars. So it basically not only you're seeing different wrinkles in the Hazuki character, but you're getting to see different wrinkles wrinkles in a good way of every other character that is in stars ultimately i'm absolutely loving it i'm excited to see where they go with it i would like for maybe after the Korokin show hazuki maybe to be like maybe she eats the l and she takes time off and then she comes back for the first time we see her in a few weeks at the uh goddess of stardom tournament 
and maybe in a big match. Maybe she's just, old, you know, Hazuki running through people left and right, and then maybe in a match they need to win. FWC needs to win to go to the finals. Maybe Hazuki drops a fall to Natsupoi as part of Mel Tier, and then she goes back into the depression, and then maybe we see her take some time off. Maybe with all these stardom wrestlers all over the place, uh, in a good way, maybe we see her do a tour of America. That would be something really cool. Maybe a little selfish for me because I would love to see Hazuki, uh, you know, wrestle live. Um, that would be really cool. And then you're basically refreshing her and then maybe bring her back at the end of the year um, on at the Sumo Hall show. There's a lot of different things they can do. But again, give credit where credit is due to the booking committee of stardom, whether you like them or not. And that's completely fine. They're doing something different. It's not the same old, same old. They're doing something different. And again, if you don't think that what they're doing with Hazuki is interesting, every one of these shows, they're all chanting her name and she's doing next to nothing. That is character development and that is something different and it's genius. And this is going to be a great, great buildup. I just hope that they, you know, they get there in the right way. Again, I am not for the, uh, the heel turn, but I ultimately think this is going to end with Hazuki finally finally winning the wonder of stardom championship because they put such an emphasis on it that the, she's just been on this such long chase for it that i think if we just keep building it up and building up properly which it looks like that we're doing it's going to mean even so much more for everybody yeah and i'm not necessarily saying we should do this every time someone loses a championship match otherwise we're just gonna have a roster of very morose wrestlers <laughs> <laughs> but when it's the story, you know, like it worked to a certain extent with Sayoriano when she lost the belt before she could defend it against Natsupoi. That worked, but then she won it back. I think that was probably just the threshold for it working. I think if you're just like, if Aya Sakura loses against Rina and then goes off on a two month like misery tour. That doesn't work. However, I feel like with the correct story, with Hazuki, it makes perfect sense. It really, really does. I mean, this match is really good as well, especially the closing section between Suzu and Sayurida. But, you know, all of these multi-women are about Hazuki. And the fact that during this match and after the match as well, Kogama is very much in denial. Um, uh, She goes back saying, she's like, everything's fine. Everything's fine. You know... Hazuki's fine, we're fine, and then Hazuki wanders off and it's like, oh, everything is not fine, Kogama. Look at what you've done. Um, but obviously that changes throughout the uh, throughout the run of shows. Main event then, Hate and Cosmic Angels. This is obviously the prelude to the challenge for the Artist of Stardom Championships. Looking back on it, I do wonder if this is why Riwaka beat Aya Sakura because then she is then part of the uh, the team going for the the um, Artist of Stardom Championships. Even so, I thought this was a really good match. Again, um, Tora chooses to isolate and target Yuna's leg instead of Tab with the Grand Deathlock, which I imagine, Matt, that you were a huge, huge fan of. It looked way better. As soon as she locked in, I was like, yes, yes, that's what I wanted to see when she was champion. Yes, I thought, great, great job. She was definitely working on it, definitely improved it. It looked a lot, lot better. So I was super excited for that. Uh, just real quick, the semi-main event, I know because it was all about the Hazuki angle. It was a great wrestling match. I actually gave it four stars as well as this main event. I thought this was terrific. Obviously, you know, you have Tam, Natsupoi, Soriano, Yuna Mizumori. Again, this was just a basically a prelude, as you said, to build up for the Artist of Stardom Championship match. That's uh, Sai Kamatani. Go absolutely insane, as per usual. Again, I don't think anybody's booing her. She was terrific. A lot of this match, Rob, and I know me and you were texting back and forth. Not in this match, but the Artist match. It really looks like they're building up a singles program with Soriano and Sai Kamatani. Tani. So yeah, I am all for that, considering the, considering the fact that we have um, Tam and Suzu at the pay-per-view. We have Mayu and Tony Storm on the pay-per-view. Looks like maybe Tekla and Natsupoi. We'll see. And then if you're going to add in some match, maybe a single, maybe a tag, where we're focusing on Hazuki versus Starlight Kid and Soriano and Saya Kamatani. Uh, I mean, you're literally coming off the five-star final, the Mambergram fight, and then this one coming up here uh, just next week in Nagoya. Really just a slew of phenomenal pay per views from start if that's the way that they go i mean that's the way it really seems like the way that they're going i would love to see these two have a singles match because they both these teams were great but majority of this match really looked like it was soriano and saya kamatani and if that was just a little bit of a preview of what we might get in a big singles match coming up soon 
I am all for because I thought they were terrific. Again, obviously, Tam not supporting Soriano. They have such great chemistry. Yuna Mizumori, I mean, she just looks better each and every outing. She has so much energy. Like, she's just she, – she does so much energy when she comes out and she's she's ready to rock and roll. Like she's so charismatic. She gets into it with the crowd. Uh, I thought she was terrific here. Obviously, Momo Watanabe does what Momo Watanabe does, and that just basically beat up, beat, you know, kick everybody's ass uh, in the best way possible. Uh, just some really really good stuff. Anytime that Suryanu would be getting ahead of steam on Saya Kamatani, building towards the finish, it would be Momo Watanabe that would kind of cut it off. Ultimately, though, I thought it was a really great ending that with Suryanu hitting the German suplex on Saya Kamatani and then. Saya basically just popping up and catching Soriano out of nowhere with her Karana for a surprise win. And then after the match, taunting her, basically saying, hey, I got you. Great match. My favorite match of this show. Four stars for me, my friend. Yeah, these hate versus um, Cosmic Angels matches really do ramp up in intensity when it's Sayoriano and Saya Kamatani in the ring. And obviously, they are far more explosive wrestlers. Um, they're far less brawly than your likes of Natsu Katora, um and your likes of Momo Watanabe. But it's so telling when these two are in the ring. It's so exciting when they're in the ring. And don't forget, you mentioned the fact that we're teasing that Saya Kamatani and Sioriano program, which I'm very much a fan of. We also got a very, very brief face-off between Tam and Saya Kamatani during that um, Artist of Stardom Championship match. And I'm still of the opinion that that might be where we're headed um, when it comes to Dream Queendom. Um, uh, so keep that in mind as well. Explosive reversals from these two as well. The fact that it was a sneak win, if you want, with the Frankensteiner. Say, Oriano doesn't eat a lot of pinfalls in stardom. Um, so to get the pinfall over, say, Oriano, big for hate. They challenged for the Artist of Stardom belts on Sunday in Kaminayama, which we're going to be talking about very, very soon. But a very, very solid show to begin with. We then move on to the second day in Aomori in Hachinoe. I think that's how you pronounce it. On Thursday, the 19th of September. Hiccup, sorry. This is um, billed as uh, Rian's homecoming show. She is in the semi-main event. Um, this is in the Utree First Floor Multipurpose Hall in Aomori. A healthy 555 people in attendance. Um, the results for this show are as follows. Um, Eight-woman tag team match, the Cosmic Angels team, Sioriano, Yuna Mizumori, Sayaka Karora, and Aya Sakura defeated the Stars team of Azuki Kagama, Momokogo, and Saya Ida, with Sioriano getting the win with the pottering. Um, Three-way match, Saya Kamatani defeated Hanan and Waka Sukiyama, Saya getting the win over Waka with the schoolboy suplex, which is never not impressive in 7 minutes and 24 seconds. Six-woman tag match, the Neo Genesis team of Azumi, Meiseira and Miyu Amasaki defeated the EXV team of Mina Shirakawa, Zina and Hanako. Azumi getting the pinfall over Hanako with the Azumi Sushi. Eight-woman tag match then. Hate, Natsukatora, Ruaka, Momo Watanabe, and Konami defeated the God's Eyes team of Suri, Saki, Kashima, Lady C, and Rana Yagami. Suri eating the pinfall. Again, we talk about uh, stuff that doesn't happen very often. Even a dirty pinfall, Suri very rarely gets pinned, but she gets pinned here by Momo Watanabe with the Peach Sunrise in 11 minutes and 45 seconds. Even if she did eat everyone's finisher on a baseball bat to the chest, that is irrelevant. Um, in the semi-main event, Micah defeated Rian with the Michinoku Driver 2 in 13 minutes and 56 seconds. And then in your main event, the first of a pair of tag team matches involving Meltia, fantastic matches involving Meltia. This one, Tam and Natsupoi defeated the Neo Genesis pairing of Starlight Kid and Suzu Suzuki, Tam pinning Suzu with the Tiger Suplex in 15 minutes and 30 seconds. Um, we'll talk about Hazuki a little bit more in a moment, but I just want to go into um, Saya Kamatani. Like, hats off to Taro Okada. When Saya Kamatani initially joined Hate, I was critical to the point of incredulousness. Both of us were. 
However, no, was I was I upset when Saya turned heel, <laughs> folks? I was wrong every week. I was wrong. Go ahead, I, I think you hid it <laughs> tremendously well, my friend. I think you were rational. Um, you were in no way emotional. It was great. Mm-hmm. Um, however, watching her come out here to this really, really great reception proves me absolutely wrong. Whilst ironically cementing the fact that she's perhaps the most popular person on the entire roster. Um, the reaction she gets as she walks out is is really quite extraordinary when you consider that she is absolutely the heel in a match that also contains Hanan and Waka Um However, the match itself is good. I just thought that was a really interesting note um, regarding Saya. Yeah, you're absolutely right, partner. Absolutely right. Again, Hanan obviously loved Waka. She's so lovable. But the fact that Saya Kamatani was as far as this crowd goes, this was this was my favorite uh, show of these four shows, and all of them were really good. There was some fantastic wrestling here. But, yeah, Saya Kamatani was, like, not only the biggest baby face in this match, again, as far as crowd reaction, but there wasn't, I don't think, any more than two or three wrestlers that got a bigger reaction than Saya Kamatani. Just came back to my previous point then about booking. Another example is obviously at Corican we have got um, the goddess of stardom titles on the line. Mom Watanabe and Tekla defending those belts against Suri and Saki Kashima. And this is a really interesting one because I think it's fair to say that Suri and God's Eye have had their collective asses handed to them by hate at every single possible opportunity. In fact, since Konami turned on God's Eye, I can't think of a meaningful victory that God's Eye have had really since. Now, my question to you, obviously, on the same sort of lines as Aya Sakura and the future title, do you think it's damaging to the challenger, or do you think this is a different story? Because from what I remember, the challenge actually comes from Suri and Saki. Didn't they lose that match? And it seems that Suri is doing it more out of emotion rather than anything else. And I'm wondering if that's sort of where we're going. She keeps losing, she keeps losing, she keeps losing, and she has to challenge because she can't bear losing, especially not to you know someone who she effectively taught to wrestle in Konami after Kano left to become Asuka. What are your thoughts on the on the hate and God's eye dynamic? Because it does seem at the moment that hate have got God's eye's number, to say the least. Great point, buddy, but this is completely different. What you're doing, you're building heat up for not only a championship match, but a championship match in Cork and Hall. Mm. Rob Goodwin, Konami and Sherry, obviously they're broken up because of what Konami did. When Konami and Sherry won the tag belts, what building was it in? That was in Corrigan Hall, Matthew. When they lost the belts because Konami turned on Sherry, where did it happen in? Uh, that was in Corrigan Hall, Matthew. Now I'm going to go to my last last point here. Or part, part of this point is this championship match coming up that they built up, and in my opinion, built up very well. Where is this championship match taking place? Um, that, would be co- that would be Corrigan Hall, Matthew. Ladies and gentlemen, so we're connecting the dots. We are selling tickets in Corrigan Hall based on these three main events with Konami and Shiri, even though Konami's not in this main event coming up on this uh, on this show coming up this weekend in Cork and Hall because you're building up a storyline that is really specific. I mean, you can obviously watch it all throughout Stardom and Stardom World, but it's really specific pretty much for Cork and Hall. Now, this match where Shiri eats the L, you said exactly right. Not only did she, was it a baseball shot, it was the Peach Thunder that put her away, the same Peach Thunder that put away Io Shirai and so many other great wrestlers throughout the years. But the, she basically eats each and every finisher on the way down. So even though it's Shuri that takes the L, here it's like, why didn't Rana take the L or somebody else take the L? Because you're building towards Momo and Tekla versus Shuri and Saki Kashima for the Goddess of Stardom Championship. Again, in the main event of Cork and Hall, as Mr. Rob Goodwin uh, so put so eloquently. But yes, you you kept Sherry strong, even though she ate the L, because she ate every finisher. She had a baseball bat shot and the Peach Thunder from Momo Watanabe. 
and again, it's not like Mama Watanabe is somebody that's in the middle of the card. She's been a main eventer for this company ever since 2018. The last five years, Mama Watanabe is somebody that can always tap on the shoulder to give a great match and tell a great story. So whether I think this is a little bit different than the Aya versus Rena buildup, um, I see your point. However, all you're doing is building more and more heat. You're getting more sympathy behind a character that everybody loves in Shuri because she's an ass kicker, right? She's an ass kicker. She's former World of Stardom champion. She's a former winner of the five-star Grand Prix. She is somebody that we all we can rally behind because she's such a great wrestler. And we're building heat onto Shuri because everybody wants to see Shuri get her revenge. We saw Shuri and Konami in Cork and Hall win the tag belts only for about a month or so later for Konami to turn on Shuri and then for them to lose the tag belts in the same building. Now we're going back to another main event that has Shuri in it with more and more of a buildup and more vengeance in Shuri's eyes, which we know that's the last person you want to piss off. Not only do we know, but all the starting wrestlers that we've been able to talk to over the last year or so, uh, past and present, they all said, not all, but majority said that Shuri hits the hardest. And guess what's going to happen in this match? Shuri's going to hit people hard, and we're all going to love it. Well, um, do I think they're going to win the tag belts? No, I think it's Saki Cashman that's going to get the win here. But I think that when this show is over, as much as we're going to talk about Tony Storm and Mayu and Azumi and what they're going on with Hazuki, when this show at in Cork and Hall is over, we're going to say, that damn Sherry, she is something else because she was out for blood. And even though they're more than likely an EPL, I think she's going to put a whooping on poor Momo Watanabe, Tekla. And even though Konami's not in the match, you know that she's going to interfere one way or another. So I have a feeling that we're going to see Konami get her ass kicked in the main event as well. So we're going to see Sherry get a little bit of a revenge and everybody's going to be happy for it because of this buildup that we've been doing with Sherry in these matches with hate. So to answer your question, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's a good thing because it's going to draw interest and sell tickets because they're going about it the right way. Yeah, and I do think that we are headed for, because that, that singles match that we got that ended in the uh, ended in the DQ, that's not going to be the final match let's be perfectly honest you know we we are building to something far bigger for these two and i i, I am still of the opinion that it should be a cage match at um at dream queendom we don't get cage matches very often at stardom definitely not for singles matches in fact the last one i think was 2022 and that was tam and uh, natsupoi um and before that I, did we ever have no. a single no the last Last cage match we had was last year with the Weto tie in uh, Queen's Quest, buddy. Singles. Oh, singles. Excuse. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. No, you're right. I think that's. Uh, I think that was it. You're right, buddy. Yeah. So you know, if you're building the feud, and I think you know there is certainly enough heat in a Konami and Siori feud, but more importantly, um, and this is what WWE really struggled to understand for a long, long time, is that putting it in a cage doesn't necessarily mean that it's it adds any heat. However, here it makes perfect sense because you want to keep hate out of the match because of the amount of time that Suri has lost. I mean, this this match here really does go to prove that, doesn't she? She had everybody's finisher before a baseball bat shot and then the peach sunrise. So that, to me, would make the perfect sense in terms of their final match, potentially at Sumo Hall in December. Um but yeah, it was it was just an interesting sort of comparison to the Aya Sakura situation. Because again, all of this is fueled by emotion. And the more that they lose, the more angry that Siori gets. So I do understand the booking for this one. I just thought it was interesting to compare and contrast. Um, let's talk more a little bit about Hazuki because uh, not only does she begin to annoy Kagama during this, but she infuriates Yuna Mizumori, who takes it as a personal insult that Hazuki wants nothing to do with this match. Rob, I always say these stardom shows, uh, they should always start off, any wrestling show, you always want to start off hot. And that's what a lot of these stardom shows over the past five or six months, they always start off with a really hot match. Not only was it a really hot match, but I think that they need to start off every stardom show with a the kuma dance because kuma <laughs> they, they start the, they start the kuma dance with this right off the get-go and it gets the crowd involved and then you get a really really good match but ultimately yes again hazuki doesn't want to be there and this is this is what they need to do you just don't want to go from one show the day before hazuki doesn't want to be there to all of a sudden she's like she's kicking ass you kind of want to keep building up that sympathy and have everybody watching to see what's going on and again the crowd that anytime hazuki was in the ring or they basically put a little bit of a focus on her they were all 
chanting Hazuki's name and very much like the day before, this was a great wrestling match that has a really interesting buildup around it with Hazuki. Again, terrific match. Yuna Mizumori obviously very, very upset with Hazuki that she didn't bring her best shot. We know Yuna Mizumori is a hard-hitting wrestler, as well as Hazuki. The one and the fact that we didn't get that because Hazuki basically wants to be anywhere but there because she's still heartbroken over this Wonder Stardom Championship match. And again, you're getting more of the Yuna Mizumori character over going being involved just a little bit in the Suzuki story. I think is absolutely brilliant because everybody's benefiting benefit from it. Not only that, but when did uh, Momo Kogo and Kagama become like a great tag team? Because you're building towards the end of this match, and there's a really cool double teaming with Momo Kogo and Kagama. I was like, wow, like seamlessly, as if like if this was your first stardom show you've ever seen, you would think those two have been tagging for years, very much like uh, Kagama and Hazuki, because their stuff towards the end was just brilliant. Like they do the, the 619, the Tiger Fang kick, Momo does, she hits it, and um, and then we do see uh, Kagama's A on Soriano, and then Kagama hits the Kuma roll on Soriano, which I thought would have been a really, really cool finish, because just how brilliantly that was done, and a great job by Soriano, uh, uh, being able to sell that the way that she does. Really great stuff with Soriano in this match. She was kind of the MVP of this match outside of the great tag work we saw with Momo and Kagama. Uh, ultimately, though, it's Soriano catching Kagama in the potter ring for the, the three count. Really hot match to start. And partner, you did not give the times for match one and three, if you can uh, let me know so I can jot those down. Um, so match one was nine minutes, ten, and si- and the six-woman tag, Neo Genesis and EXV, was 11.45. Thank you, good sir. I just like to have those. But I had actually this one as the opener. Uh, again, great storyline going on with Hazuki. I had it at four stars. Great match, hot match to start. Again, Kagama doing the Kuma dance to start. Gets everybody involved. And once this gets going, this gets going. Obviously, Unimori is Mori, great. We do see Sayaka Karora and Aya Sakura do more of their tag team stuff, which we're always a really big fan of. Just really great stuff. Saida in there as well. I mean, everybody loves Saida. But uh, yeah, again, ultimately, this we're building up the Hazuki storyline. And again, Momo Kogo and Kagama really, really working together as a well oiled machine, almost as if they were picking up the slack from Hazuki not being in the match. But again, ultimately, Soriano getting a big win here to start off. Another great show. Four stars for me, partner. So let's talk then, Matt. Before we get into the main event matches, what do you want to talk about anything else on this undercard? Uh, again, this was another really, really solid show. Match three for me, I thought was really great with Mina Hanako Zina versus Mei Sarah Miyu Amasaki and Azumi. I thought there was some really, really uh, great wrestling here between all three, uh, re- uh, basically, the, excuse me, all six wrestlers and the two teams. But again, another great job building Hanako up here. She looked like an absolute monster, literally to the point when they're building towards the finish of the match. I thought she was going to get the win over Azumi. I'd be like, boy, we're really properly, but we're going all in on this Hanako thing. The fact that she's going to be a white hot Azumi. But uh, again, that's just the genius of how this match is built, where ultimately it's Azumi getting out of the JP coaster, hitting a head kick in the La Mystica, in the Azumi Sushi for the win. This match, the crowd was so hot for. Again, Mina Shirakawa, somebody that's over. Hanako is basically kind of the new cool thing uh, since coming back from the States. Xena. Maybe uh, her and May Sakurai probably the most into, uh, most improved wrestlers in all of wrestling for this year. And then you're up against the cool new faction in Neo Genesis that everybody just absolutely loves. Uh, I thought the crowd was just so into this. They crowd added so much more into what was already a great match. I had this one at four stars. And I liked how after the match, Neo Genesis ran to a food cart afterwards to get some uh, drinks and some beer. I thought that was really, really cool because they're they're like the new cool faction now they're like you know the new it and i just thought it was really cool i was like after the match what do you want to do you want to get something to eat and celebrate your win and that's what these three wrestlers did and i thought that was really cool to show the human aspect of these three wrestlers that are crazy over with the crowd uh again four stars for me yeah i'm i'm never not going to be impressed by the speed at which azumi and mace are able to operate but when it's brought into even sharper relief because the pair are performing this offense in tandem, it's, it just blows my mind how good these two are. Um, and it, it adds to what was a really fun multi-woman match. Three and a half stars from me. I love the fact that we had a well-received return to May and Xena's high-speed championship match. We had Mina absolutely leveling 
both Azumi and Miu with these forearms. I think it was the one to Miu in particular, properly echoed. And then again, you've, you're absolutely right. Hanako, even in a loss, looked really, really powerful. Her and uh, Zena taking it in turns to really showcase that strength and power. Really, really good match. Thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, speaking of thoroughly enjoyed it and stiff, stiff forearms, um, let's talk about Rina and Micah. As I mentioned before, we're in Rian's hometown tonight. And we get a ceremony to start proceedings with her being given an ungodly amount of flowers. Like, I'm not joking. The poor girl was given about 23 bouquets of flowers. Um, she struggles to hold all of them long enough for photos. And then on top of that, mm. has to face off with the former World of Stardom champion, Micah. So, uh, yeah, not not the easiest of matches for Rian. But, Matt, I think it's important to know, I don't think I've ever seen Rian embark on Matt-based wrestling. And though she is undoubtedly Micah's subordinate in that area, I don't think either of us are going to be, uh, are going to be disagreeing with that. Her willingness to do it, clearly impresses Micah. And that's sort of the story throughout this match, at least for me, is that Micah is constantly able to cut Rian down, is able to overpower Rian. But the more she fights back, the more tenacity, the more determination that she shows, the more that Micah seems to be impressed with it. And nowhere is that better illustrated than the finish where she's, <laughs> Micah absolutely destroys her with this lariat. Like, she hits this lariat and my collarbone hurt um, and sort of demands that Rianne gets to her feet or at least tries to get to her feet. And she does, the rookie does. It takes her a while, but she does get there, manages to crawl to her knees, aim a very lethargic forearm into Micah's midriff. And that's it. Micah gives her a nod, hits the Michinoku driver two for the win, and is so impressed that she accepts Rian into EXV. Again, fantastic performance from Rian. She got the absolute stuffing beaten out of her, but comes out of it really smelling of roses, though she probably didn't feel like it at the time. Really enjoyed this match, Matt. Uh, I'm about to pop you because she smelled like roses because she got 84,000 bouquets of them. That's the reason why <laughs> yeah, she came out smelling like so roses. So many flowers. I mean, not only is it a great performance, but this is a building that stardom is usually not on the regular loop. And I could be wrong, but it just looked different. Like, obviously, I'm sure they wrestled there before, but it's not like your KBS Halls, your Corkins, you know, uh, Nagoya, like those ones. And considering the fact that you have Rian here and she's going to obviously be a part of this stardom roster for quite some time. She's a draw in her hometown. So this is a building that they could be like, right, we can probably go back and run this maybe once a month, once every six weeks or so, and draw a big number because it didn't look like there were too many empty seats in this building, partner. Did not look like there was too many. 555 people, that's a really, really strong number. So again, the fact that we already have this loaded stardom roster, we're doing some really interesting things as far as the booking goes. And now we got Rihanna on the show. The fact that Rihanna is a draw in this one particular building – just really just goes adds to something with it. But like, you know what? Maybe we should put this one on the uh, the tour schedule. Again, maybe once every four to five weeks, just so, um, you know, Rihanna can get a big match in her hometown and we'll draw another strong number. So again, this is just adding on to all the great stuff that Stardom is doing. But the fact that this one went almost 14 minutes and Rihanna does get showcased quite a bit in the grappling. Again, Micah, she's got that background in judo. She's a legit badass. Uh, really, really, really interesting stuff. But the fact that she's able to hang with Micah, and again, kudos to Micah, taking somebody that's on the bottom of the card and making her look ultimately really, really good. And again, that's the goal because once, once Micah beats her, it makes Micah look better. It's not like she did, she did, you know, didn't defeat anybody. Somebody that was built up very well in this match. Two, it's Rian's hometown. A lot of people paid tickets to see her wrestle. A lot of people were invested into that match, maybe then more so than the other ones. Um, and three, what happens afterwards? Rian joins the group that Micah is pretty much the uh, quote unquote leader for. So ultimately, it's a win win for everybody. And it goes to show that if needed to, Rian, if she's wrestling one of these main event wrestlers, can go the 10, 11, 12 minutes because she can hang with a top tier in stardom and again the fact that she's only been wrestling in less than a year is really kudos to her solid outing obviously it did it we didn't need to do especially at the end with micah just blitzing her with all the big moves that micah does i had it three and a half stars but ultimately yeah it was a really good outing from our hometown hero here brother 
yeah, it was a predictable finish. We all knew that Michael was going to win and relatively decisively, but it was about how Rian lost and that tenacity and that sort of heart and fighting spirit that she showed was perfect for what they were trying to achieve. Just going back to what you said, um, this is the largest crowd that they have brought into the U-Tree first floor multi-purpose hall in A. Murray. They've run it three times before, once in 2021, once in 2023, and then obviously the 555 that they drew on Thursday. Um, significantly more than their previous best as well. I believe their previous best was something like 392 people, so uh, significant improvement on that. Um Meltier and Neogenesis, Matt, I mean, what do we even say about this? I can only begin to imagine how brutal this Red Bell match in Nagoya is going to be because Tam and Suzu Suzuki, if looks could kill, Suzu Suzuki is going to get life without parole because the cold look she fixes Tam with prior to the match is enough to frighten even the hardest of wrestling fans. She is, when angered, Perhaps the most terrifying person, say for Suri, on this roster map. It's another week of wrestling goes by, Rob Goodwin, and it's another week of Joshi. Phenomenal, phenomenal stardom tag action. Obviously, we've seen it in stardom. We've seen the Sariism shows. We've been able to see it in Mary Gold because they're putting on some great tag wrestling. And it just really seems like the Joshi style wrestlers, especially in stardom, really just have great, great new era tag team wrestling down to a science. And this is just another great tag match in the category of great uh, tag wrestling in stardom in 2024. This is my favorite match of all four of these shows. Obviously, you have Mel Tier together. By the way, Mel Tier, they came out to uh, two different themes. Rob Goon for both this show and the next show, they came out to... Uh, uh, they came out to Tear Tales and Flowing, just letting everybody know. I'm just, you know, getting the, uh, <laughs> the my journalism, you know. I'm sure that everybody wants to know that. The crux of these two matches is we're trying to sell more tickets and more pay-per-views and English pay-per-views. And again, congratulations, Walker, our buddy Walker Stewart being doing the English commentary on the show coming up next week. We want to be able to sell more intrigue to this World of Stardom Championship match. And boy, how did, it, did they? And I mentioned the day before Tam versus Micah, where they had that new blood show uh, about two weeks ago. I text you. I said, if this is a preview of what we're getting tomorrow, we're in for a treat. And we, we were in for a treat. The Suzu and Tam exchanges, it was like they were not holding back whatsoever. We know Suzu can hit hard. We knew Tam can hit hard. And Tam was taking some of these slaps and forearms and kicks. And it was, I mean, we did see that her face was all swelled up to the point where I think it was either yesterday or today, they did some sort of cosmic angels thing. Um, I forget where, where it was like maybe something with a book or, or something. I, I don't know what it was. And Tam had an eye patch on her eye because she was that swollen up like Sue. And I think it was from these two matches with Suzu because these two laid into each other. And you have to give credit to Tam Nakano. Again, she's the cosmic angel. She's the cutest in the universe. You know, the, you know this, that, and the other thing. She has no problem getting her face messed up. We've seen it here in the Suzu matches. We've seen it in the, the Micah match. We've seen it in the feud with Julia. She's got no problem. You know, somebody that, again, who is, again, I'm not just saying this because I'm the leader of the Tam Road, somebody that has a very, very pretty face has got no problem getting this thing smashed in. And Suzu Suzuki had no problem smashing it in for Tam in this match because this was wild. We started the match off with Suzu and Tam for Forum Fest to trade to start. And I'm like, geez, we're going here already? Like, this show is in two weeks, and this is how we're planting the seeds? Okay, fine with me. I mean, really just great stiff action with Tam and Suzu. Eventually, we get the Meltier stuff. that, uh, And I love this when it comes to the Meltier matches, where if Suzu, or excuse me, if Tam is in trouble or not to poison trouble, the other one comes in, and we do see some Meltier double team work that basically gets the advantage for the Red Belt champion and the, and the White Belt champion here, and Tam and not to poison, because they've been teaming longer uh, and more frequently than Suzu and Starlight Kid. Obviously, Neo Genesis, you know, a, a newer group, just a few months old. But I like that. I really, really like that. And then eventually, uh, we get back to some singles action. We have Natsu Point Starlight Kid. And they're like, yeah, remember we had this great rivalry in 2021 for the High Speed Championship? Let's revisit that for about two minutes. And it was terrific. So you have two different tales in this match, two different stories. The hard-hitting of Suzu and Tam and the high-speed and just beautiful wrestling that is Starlight Kid and Natsu. 
Natsupoy. I eventually think that after Natsupoy's next championship match that we're going to see Natsupoy and Starlight Kid. Just the way that some of this stuff has been built up, not only in the ring, but post-match promos and stuff that they're saying on social media. I think we're going to eventually get a Natsupoy versus Starlight Kid Wonder of Stardom Championship match. Maybe at Sumo Hall. Uh, regardless, anywhere that, that it happens, we're going to be all for it. Uh, ultimately, though, we eventually get back to Tam versus Suzu Suzuki, and they pick up right where they left off. Just some brutal exchanges back and forth. Um, Suzu and Tam, or excuse me, Mel Tay, Rob. I love me some Suzu Suzuki, but she broke my heart. They tried the hand holding dive. I'm like, oh, here it is. Coolest move in the history of wrestling. And Suzu's like, absolutely not. She breaks up the hand holding dive. Eventually, though, we do see the Natsu Boy giant dive from the post where it looks like that she's never going to come down. She's hanging in the air, very much like Jordan in 93. Um, eventually, Meltier, they are able to get the advantage back with a super kick combination to uh, Suzu Suzuki. Uh, we get a German exchange between um, Suzu and Tam. We get a spin kick violent shooting combination from uh, Tam Nakano. Suzu Suzuki is able to fire back with some stiff, 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 stiff strikes to the World of Stardom champion. Eventually, Tam Nakano hits a even stiffer, stiffer ripcord spin kick that leads into the Tiger Suplex for a three count. This is a great match on so many levels. We built up great tag, tag action. We built up Tam versus Suzu. We teased Starlight Kid versus Natsupoi, where hopefully that's where where we go ultimately this ends in brutal brutal fashion again another phenomenal tag match in the catalog of stardom i have this at four and a half stars absolutely loved it partner yeah i gave it four stars this is going to be incredible and as i've already mentioned suzu is livid during this the anger drips off every word she delivers in this post-match interview and then she storms to the back refusing to give so much as a word to the backstage interviewers. I do wonder how much Suzu blames Tam for their red belt match not happening. Don't know how much Tam could do about it. She was injured at the time, but you know, I wonder if Suzu does blame her for that. And again, if this and the match from Sendai give us an indication as to what we are to expect in Nagoya, we're going to have a sensational red belt match. And just recently, Suzu Suzuki has started to up it a level, and good grief, she's terrifying when she does that. And if we're going to get that on top of Starlight Kid and Natsupoi, or Star, or even Natsupoi and Tekla, because that was really good as well in Sendai, it's going to be quite the experience. It's going to be quite the pay per view. Um, four stars from me, really, really good. We then had a show. From Sendai on Saturday, the 21st of September, 2024. 275 people in attendance, which for Sendai Pit is not a terrible attendance. Stardom have got 493 in there at their top. Their average is about 280, though. So just ever so slightly below average, but not the end of the world at all. Uh, Mai Wutani and Tekla both return to action for this show, with Tekla actually taking part in the main event. Your results are as follows. So, uh, Neo Genesis, Starlight Kid, Meisera Mio Amasaki defeated Stars, Hazuki Kogama and Hanan. Meisera pinning Hazuki with the drop kick in 10 minutes and 23 seconds. Uh, Sayurida defeated Aisakura in singles action with a lariat in 9 minutes and 9 seconds. A three-way match, Azumi defeated Saki Kashima and Wakasukiyama with the Azumi Sushi in 7 minutes and 36 seconds on Saki Kashima. In a three-way tag match, Peach Rock, Mayu Utani and Momokogo defeated the team of EXV, Hanako and Rian, and the hate team of Momo Watanabe and Konami, Mayu Utani pinning Rian with the European Clutch in 8 minutes and 52 seconds. Six-woman tag match saw EXV, Micah, Mina, and Xena defeating the God's Eye team of Suri, Lady C, and Rana Yagami. Xena pinning Lady C with the Thunderstruck in 13 minutes and 43 seconds. Six-woman tag match, the Cosmic Angels team, Seoriano, Sayaka Karura, and Yuna Mizumori defeated the hate team 
of Nats, Katora, Saya Kamatani, and Ruaka. Yuna Mizumori pinning Ruaka with the Tropicana in 10 minutes and 51 seconds. And then in your main event, another fantastic tag match. Suzu Suzuki and Tekla defeated the Meltier team of Tam Nakano and Natsupoi. Suzu getting a little bit of revenge over Tam with the tequila shot in 6 minutes and 28 seconds. But Matt, the most pressing question to come out of Sendai, I think you will agree, is when will Miyu Amasaki learn? Three times she has volunteered to do the Kuma dance. Three times. And three times she has found herself on the back foot when Kogama attacks afterwards. I I, I struggle to have sympathy for her. I really do. Do you think that I'm going to kind of, I see your point here. I'm going to play double advocate maybe you think that just kagama is just so enchanting with the kuma dance <laughs> very much how like hypnotic. very much like how she's she used to get yeah hypnotic she used to get himika remember that to the point where micah remember then she got micah scared and then that one show micah came out in the bear outfit i think it was in 20, 2021 <laughs> or 2022 uh, maybe that's what they do with miyu amasaki maybe she comes out in a bear outfit but uh yeah again very much like the last show we start out with a hot match and we start out with the kuma dance we should be doing that just about every show not unless there's a title match but regardless this yeah you're absolutely right poor Miyu Amasaki she's just so gullible again she's only been wrestling about two years or so I think maybe Suzu Suzu because I mean who's going to teach her maybe Starlight Kid because Starlight Kid and Kagama have feuded before uh Azumi Azumi's so lovable so it's not going to be Azumi I think it's got to be Suzu Suzuki that it's going to be like look next time she does the Kuma dance just punch her right in the face as hard as humanly <laughs> possible uh maybe maybe that's where this goes I don't know but yeah uh match number one was a really fun match again we're adding time Onto the everything going on with Suzuki, kind of not wanting to be there. Rahan and Kagama has to kind of pick up the steam for this match. Where again, now we're building to the Starlight Kid and Hazuki storyline, where it's just like, where is this going? We're not sure, but it's really interesting. May Sarah, she was the as far as the actual wrestling goes, because with a lot of in, uh, intertwined storyline goes. May Sarah, for me, she was the MVP of this match. Really great way to start the show off. Three and a half stars for me, partner. Yeah, really enjoyed it. I gave it three. Now, one thing I did enjoy is how Kogama loses patience with Hazuki, slaps her across the back and yells at her to focus up. And I think this, coupled with Starlight Kid's fury at her lack of fight, we briefly seem to get Hazuki waking from her slump. She begins fighting back with this roar of passion. It takes one move to quell that again, though. And that drop kick from Maysera, as good as it is, like it seems to drive out the microscopic flicker of fight she'd mustered. Um, Maysera gets the win. Hazuki lies there and has to be escorted out by Kogama, who delivers a tasty slap across the face in their backstage, um, basically telling her to wake up, um, maybe even telling her to not be so selfish. Um and then, obviously, when we get to the post-show from Kamen Amaya, we get a very emotional Hazuki, an emotional stars, an emotional Sayurida. I don't know why, but when Sayurida cries, I cry. Um, it's it, it's all very emotional. Um, so, yeah, I think they're doing a very, very good job of this. And credit to Hazuki, but credit to Kagama as well, because she is pivotal to this storyline. And we, we, we've we had quite a few people say, oh, I think Hazuki should turn to hate it. You know, it, it makes sense. And as I said at the start of the episode, yes, it does make sense. However, she came back to wrestling, at least in huge part, to Kogama and her friendship, her real-life friendship with Kogama. I don't think if she is given the option, I don't think she'll turn heel anyway, because I think she enjoys being with Kogama. So... That aside, though, I think this story, as I've said before, is so captivating and Kogama is so key to this story because their real-life friendship, you've got Kogama, who's perhaps the only person who can properly slap Azuki in the face and not get a big boot. So I'm all for it. I think this is really, really good. Um, uh, Sayurida obviously absolutely destroys Aya Sakura with a lariat, um, but that doesn't tell the whole story. Sakura actually looks like she might get the win with that triangle choke, but Sayurida is able to deadlift her into a powerbomb, which was really cool. Fights valiantly, but 
you know, ultimately Saya Ida has a little bit too much about her. However, she does respond to those meaty, meaty chops with a volley of kicks to the chest. Matt, how did you think Aya Sakura looked here? Yeah, we mentioned a little bit ago, um, I thought she'd look great here, even though coming off the loss. And I'm a big fan of when everybody the, does the uh, Rampage Jackson powerbomb out of the uh, the triangle choke. And that's what Saida does here to break the triangle choke. Again, shout out to uh, Rampage Jackson, former uh, light heavyweight champion, uh, not only from Pride, but from UFC. But I like the chopping and kicking back and forth. The ISO core kicks are getting better and better each and every show um and not only is like you know the placement of them how she does them how she pulls them off how she builds to them the you know the flurry of kicks that she does and again she's been using that head kick that leads into the triangle choke i really like that one two combination from her uh, ultimately though it's just saida just doing what saida does and that's uh just the layering you know layering everybody so uh ultimately though that was a really good match three and a half stars but i thought is the core even in a loss looked really good here Moving on then, um, uh, just briefly talking about this th- three-way between Azumi and uh, Sa- Saki Kashima and, uh, and Wax Tsukiyama, because I did really enjoy this. Um, I didn't quite go into the detail that I wanted to about how Saki got the win in the previous three-way, where she head-scissored Micah out of the ring and landed on top of Sayaka Karora for the victory. I, I thought that was a really unique finish. And she tries to do the same here, but Azumi's able to grab the victory with the Azumi Sushi. But Saki Kashima is the gift that keeps on giving because then she tries to pick a fight with Daichi for counting too slowly. So then Azumi rolls her up and Daichi does the most ludicrously over-the-top fast count. And it's gr- and then Rani Yagami's on the outside. It, it It's great. It really is great. And then, of course, Wakasukiyama is made to run the ropes and run the ropes and run the ropes. And the poor woman is exhausted. She needs a timeout, needs a bottle of water provided by a very, very concerned Mina Shirakawa at ringside. Actual wrestling-wise, it's a good match, but the comedy really got to me. And that's what I love about these Saki Kashima three ways, two and three quarter stars. Good match. Probably should go and check it out. But for me, just entertaining, Matt. I really like the, and again, I, we only we've ever seen a fast count in stardom before, especially Daichi, just to kind of be like, oh, you know, hey, Saki, you're pushing the wrong buttons. I'm the one that calls the finish here. But I like how the finish, it looks like Saki Kashin is going to steal one. Azumi hits that beautiful double stomp onto Waka. And then Saki Kashima looks like she's going to steal the pin. And when she hooks Waka's leg, Azumi just comes over, gets wrist control, and then rolls up Saki into the Azumi Sushi. I thought that was terrific because we see Saki Kashima all the time steal these wins, and then Azumi's just too slick for Saki Kashima and this one getting the win. Uh, yeah, I had it at three stars. I thought it was more, the, the wrestling in it was good. Again, it's Azumi, it's Saki Kashima, it's Waka. They're three terrific wrestlers, especially Azumi is one of the best in the world. But this was basically yeah, your comedy match. You kind of, you know, you kind of need a little bit of a breather in between some of these hard hitting matches that we've been getting here. But this was uh, a little bit different and it was fun. Moving on then, we had a baptism of fire. For poor Rianne, yes, she's now officially a member of EXV and she has a, an actual home for the first time in a short career. But the opening of this match is little but both stars and hate taking liberties with her. Um, she gets absolutely battered during the opening of this match, doesn't she, Matt? Yeah, she really does. I mean, you have Momo, Konami, Mayu Iwatani, you know, and Momo Kogo, is, is, she's not by no means a she... Uh, Momo Watanabe or Sherry when it comes to the hitting, but she can lay it in when she needs to. But uh, ultimately, yeah, poor Rianne is just like, hey, guess that's what? You're part of a faction now. Now everybody gets to beat on you. Um, Hanago looks great here as well. But I made mention uh, just yesterday when we did the ultimate commentary that this is, you know, one of the first actual peach rock matches we've seen in quite some time. And what I mean is there's, it's not, you know, Han is not in there. Hazuki's not in there. It's just Mayu and Momo Kogo. They were part of the goddess of stardom tournament uh, two years ago as peach rock. And I thought they were terrific here. Gelled better than they ever had before. Momo Kogo is having a really, really great year despite all the injuries. And again, we talk about it all the time. We have so much respect for her being able to wrestle, wrestle as well as she does and the style that she does wrestling with Graves disease. I mean, just really goes to show you how much she loves wrestling. Mayu again, she's on the run of her life. These two look terrific here together. And I mentioned it to you before off the air, when it comes to this goddess of stardom tournament, 
I'm really hoping as much as I love eye contact, as much as I love Mayu and Hanan together, I really hope it's Wingori, Hanan and Saeed as a, the team and Mayu and Momokogo, because I really think that, um, that um, Mayu and Momokogo can benefit so much better as a team teaming up in this tournament. Uh, I thought ultimately that was a really, really, really good match. Momo, Watanabe, and uh, Mayu, whenever they're ringed together, even though it was brief, it's always magic. I had it three and three fourth stars. Moving on then, Matt, to uh, I'm a man of simple pleasures, I'll be perfectly honest, um, and a standoff between Micah and Suri, it turns out, is all I need to get excited about a match. They don't even have to do anything. They just need to be standing across from each other in the ring. And it just reminded me of the title match that we aren't able to get because of the bloody Torah experiment. And I was very, very briefly despondent. I was contemplating everything. I was feeling very much like Hazuki. Um, but thankfully, this match, uh, this match cheered me up because it was good fun. Yeah, again, we had a really great underrated match for Series World of Stardom Championship back in the fall of 2022 with Sherry and Micah that not a lot of people talk about. It's just a great, great match that kind of gets lost in the shuffle of great World of Stardom Championship matches that Sherry had uh, two years ago. But yeah, and I thought that that's the way we were going to go. I really thought with Micah, with all the steam they had behind her, I really thought we were going to get a Micah versus Sherry championship match. Maybe in Micah's second run, if that's the way they go. But regardless, this match just basically broils down the Lady C and Zena just chopping the crap out of each other. Rana was great. Mina was great. Don't get me wrong. But really, this match just focused on Zena and Lady C just going at it, really, with the uh, the chops and the boots back and forth. I mean, these two really took advantage of the ring time that they got here. Ultimately, though, it's Zena with the Thunderstruck on the Lady C. I had this one at three and a half stars, sir. Um, Agreed. Completely agree. I thought Lady C and Xena were my MVPs of this match, despite a very tasty, uh, but all too brief, Micah and Suri exchange. I think Lady C is actually the first person to draw a flicker of pain from Xena in a chop exchange, which was entertaining. But of course, you know, you don't get the nickname The Great Car C without being a fantastic chopper. Um, I thought their exchange to finish the match as well was really, really good. Lady C is someone that's coming on leaps and bounds. Unfortunately, the wins aren't coming because it's part of the wider story between God's Eye and with hate. But ultimately, I think she's going to really, really benefit and flourish, I think, as part of God's Eye. So maybe the breakup of Queen's Quest was a good thing, Matt. Anyway, <laughs> match number six. Sorry, I don't know. Keep the tr- I knew it would upset you. Um, the main event matches then. So the Cosmic Angels and Hate match. Uh, what did you think of this? Again, Soriano. This is basically story. Tora Ruaka, they were great. Yuna Mizumori, Sakura, they were great as usual. But again, this match was just the build towards whatever we're getting with Soriano and Sayakamitani. And it was done really, really well um, with these two just kind of going back and forth. We saw a little glimpse of what this match could be with Soriano and Sayakamitani. And these two absolutely tore it up. And I like it how, very again, very much into these matches that Soriano is in that doesn't have Tam or Natsupoy. Whether it's basically Soriano and then some of the understudies from Cosmic Angels where she's directing traffic and when things get a little bit too heavy, she comes in and makes the save. And then ultimately what happens here, we see Ruaka coming in here as this match breaks down. We get the referee that's blinded and blinded in a good way was not... uh, you know, it didn't get you know o- too overly complicated. They kept it simple with the ref blinding here. And eventually that we do see Ruaka with that uh, lunch crate, milk crate thing that we hate. And then eventually it's Soriano that is able to stop the milk crate shot. Yuna Mizumori that opens up the door for Yuna to get the Travacano roll up for the three count. It was a solid match, three and a half stars. Again, I really like how Soriano is just watching over the younger members of Cosmic Angels. And ultimately that's building up to Soriano versus Sai Kamatani which I absolutely cannot wait for. I think as well, Sayoriano was the, the MVP of the Artist of Stardom Championship match, and we'll talk a little bit more about that very shortly, but she had a really, really good run of shows. Um, moving on to the Suzu and Tekla team up against Melty, it was, it was a weird dynamic between those two, but ultimately we didn't get a tag team match, in my opinion anyway. What we got was two very separate singles matches um, that just happened to be taking part in a similar sphere. Now, 
what is interesting is that you have got Tackler, who's the heeliest heel in the heeliest stable, effectively wrestling a very clean match with Natsupoi. Um, whatever is going on there is very strange. She has the chance to cheat. She rips the belt off and is all for whipping Natsupoi with it and then decides against it, throws it away. Natsupoi's smiling the entire time. You know, they're they're having a proper wrestling match. So whether that goes towards a white belt match, which I think it probably will, I'm interested to see where Tekla is taking this with the hate towel that she gave to Natsupoi after number grand fight. You know, she came out and raised the arm. We had some very cordial exchanges a couple of weeks back. It's it's an interesting dynamic and I'm intrigued to know where it's going because I imagine it is something deeper than just, hey, we used to be in Donna Del Mondo together. So it'll be interesting to see where that goes. But then on the flip side of that, you've then got just what is effectively a hellish brawl between Suzu and Tam, who just forego wrestling entirely in an attempt to just hurt each other. Tam's face by the end of this, looks almost as bad as it did the previous night. And Suzu Suzuki is having absolutely none of Tam's shtick. All of it is just hard-hitting strikes and kicks to the other's face. And if that's what we get for 20 minutes in Nagoya, hell to the yes, Matt Turner. Yeah, um, I think, as far as what I think they're going with, is Tekla and Natsupoi. It could be one one of a few things. One, she might be court. And I mentioned this last week. Maybe Tekla's courting Natsupoi to come over to hate where they they turn. Natsupoi, you know, the murder pixie into the dark murder pixie. That's something in, very interesting. Or, again, I think if anybody from Cosmic Angels is going to turn, it's going to be Soriano. Uh, uh, you know, in due time. Maybe that's a long-term story where it looks like that. Natsupoi, you know, they're trying to get Natsupoi to come to the faction where ultimately it was Soriano all along. That's something they can go. Or I think just the storyline that they're going with, or at least right now, is Tekla, is, who's the idol killer, who, again, is, in my opinion, the best heel, actual heel, in the biggest heel faction in Star. I'm not saying she's the best worker. But she's a great worker, but she's not on Kamatani or Momo Watanabe's level. 99% of the wrestling universe isn't, but she is the best actual heel at drawing heat in this faction. But she's overly nice to Natsupoi, considering the fact that Natsupoi is in a faction with Sakakura, and Aya Sakura, and again, Tekla has been basically, uh, you know, been basically an absolute nightmare to those to those two wrestlers. So it's like, what is Tekla up to? My guess is she's playing on Natsupoi's sympathy because we know how much of a sweetheart Natsupoi is. Again, she defeated Hazuki, and right afterwards, she told Hazuki, "Don't don't give up. You know, come back and challenge me for this belt when you're ready again." I think she's playing up on the niceness and the sympathy, the sympathetic character that is Natsupoi. We're going into this Wonder of Stardom Championship match that we're pro- again that we're probably going to get next week. We'll find out probably more after Corican. Is that um, she's going to have Natsupoi is going to have her guard down, and she's going to be wrestling maybe a softer match. Ultimately, though, eventually, though, I think you're going to see Tekla do something in that match that's going to snap Natsupoi to be in a full murder pixie mode to get that win. As as great as Tekla is, I just don't see Tekla winning the Wonder of Stardom Championship, especially this early on to Natsupoi's run. But again, it's very interesting. It's very interesting where they go. But you're absolutely right. Outside of a couple tag team moves from Meltier, the classic uh, Meltier stuff, this is just an absolute fight between four fantastic wrestlers. Obviously, Suzu and Tekla, they're not a tag team, and they're on completely different opposite ends of the spectrum when it comes to uh, you know the factions that they're in. But I get it. You're, you're, you're building up Suzu versus Tam and more than likely not Sepoy versus Tekla, and ultimately which just turns into a brutal, brutal match with Suzu and Tam, with Suzu getting her win back from the night before. So I like that 50-50 booking because it makes sense as we go into Nagoya next week. Four stars for me, my friend. Same for me. I thought both these main events with Suzu and Tam were absolutely fantastic. The fact that they then brawl through the backstage interview area just adds that little bit more heat. You do get the impression that these two very much do not like each other. And it is a very, very real, real dislike. And that that realism adds a lot of intrigue when it comes to wrestling matches. And that main event, I do anticipate Tam retaining. 
but I imagine that Suzu is going to put her through absolute hell um, in preparation for that match. Um, I'm very, very excited to see that. I'll be interested as well to see if that main event over Mayu and Tony Storm. If you were, if you were President Okada, what would you pick? Um, I would pick Tam versus Suzu because if that's your belt, that's your big belt, that's the World of Stardom Championship, mm-hmm. and uh, you know you're putting all that steam behind one uh, one Tam. Regardless, I mean it's a win win. It's really a win win. Obviously, you have the bigger star power with Mayu being again the biggest star in the history of the company, and Tony Storm again the biggest women's wrestling star in the history of AEW, the second biggest wrestling company in all of the planet. So I mean you have that. But at the same time, I mean, both matches are going to be great, but I'm going to kind of just throw this one at you, Rob. What do you think is going to be the actual better match uh, between the two? And what and what do you think is going to be the main event? So I'm going to throw your question back and add you a question, sir. And I think Tam is, uh, I think Tam and Suzu is going to be the one, two main event. But again, you can't go around with either one of those matches. Agreed. And I do think that Tony will be a, a draw. Uh, Storm, obviously, not Khan. Um or Atlas or whatever other Tony there are. Wow, look um, at that. You keep our, our Tony Tony Tony, the pop group from the nineties anyway. Absolutely. <laughs> um <laughs> but I do think that you need to have your red belt on top. Um irrelevant of who is wrestling. Because you know, All Star Grand Queendom, you could argue that Mayu and Sari had had a claim to main event that show. But ultimately, you know, the right decision prevailed. Um, the red belt should always have, hold precedence um, on stardom shows. In terms of what match is better or what match will be better in ring, um, obviously you've got Mayu Iwatani. And, you know, we've said for as long as we've done this podcast that Mayu Iwatani could have a four-star match with a broomstick. Um Tony Storm is a very, very good wrestler. A very good wrestler. She hasn't wrestled in Japan since 2019. Her current gimmick is very character-driven. I will be interested to see how that meshes with Mayu in a Japanese wrestling setting. And I suppose we'll have more of a more of an idea after Corican Hall. Yeah, yeah, we can kind of uh, speculate a little more on that one. But uh, yeah, it's just interesting to get your take on that. But you mentioned All-Star Grand Queendom, not only this year, but last year. Mm. With Mayu and Sari being a big match in the one last year, with Mayu and Mercedes yeah. really being the one that drew a lot of the tickets. But at the same time, they put the World of Stardom Championship match on last. So uh, yeah, I mean, we'll see. But yeah, I think it's going to be Tam and Suzu as far as, again, what the better match is. Um, as of right now, I'm going to say it's Tam and Suzu, but we'll probably know more because we're going to see some of the chemistry of us uh, of Tony and Mayu in Cork and Hall coming up here just this weekend. So again, regardless, two great matches uh, for two very two, for two belts that have been built up. You know what Mayu's done with the IWGP Women's Championship. Regardless of what how New Japan treats it, you can't deny that. I mean, she's taken a belt that New Japan really can care less about and made it really really important. And the World of Stardom Championship again, the lineage to the Mayus, to the uh, you know to the to the EO, to the Kyries, the Mako. Satomaros, the Utamis, the Sherrys, when you just what recently what Mike has done with the belt. I mean, you have two big championship matches on that show, uh, you know, and I cannot wait uh, next week for to preview it with you, buddy. No, absolutely. It's going to be a very, very tasty pay per view. And I, I do expect that that card will be announced on Monday um, following the Corrigan Hall show. Um, we move on then to stardom in Kamino Yama in uh, Yamagata um, from Sunday, the 22nd of September 2024. Um, this took place from the Nagata City. No, it didn't. It took place from the Sanyo Engineering Sports Bunker Center in Yamagata. 328 people in attendance, which is even more impressive when you consider that apparently it was absolutely hammering it down in Yamagata. They were having some manner of tropical storm um, at the time, and the decision was actually made prior to the show by President Taro Okada that the entire show would actually be streamed for free on YouTube because of people not being able to get to the show, which was a fantastic, um, a fantastic gesture from stardom um though it didn't look like there was many empty seats matt like you pointed out 
No, I saw that again. My Sundays are just absolutely insanely busy. And I saw that on Sunday morning um, and I was getting ready to start my day that they, because of the downpour and the storm they were having, this match was going to be on YouTube for free. And I was like, oh, that's a really, really cool thing. So everybody can see the show that has, you know, the Cosmic Angels versus Hate championship match on as the main event. And then when I watched this match just yesterday, I text you and I was like, okay, well, we, they, the whole idea was because a lot of people couldn't come to this show because it was raining. There wasn't many empty seats. Not unless they sold some seats up top. I didn't see any empty chairs whatsoever. So again, kudos to them. And I mentioned at the beginning of the show, I'm going to make mention to again. I was really, when I came home from, uh, when I finally got done with my long, long Sunday, I was just curious just to see how many streams this thing did in less than 24 hours. It was like 110,000 streams this show did on literally no build. It's not like nobody, they didn't, they didn't make the decision until like almost bell time that this was going to be free on YouTube. It's not like, Hey, the Cork and Hall show next week that has Tony Storm on it is going to be on YouTube. You know, here's seven, eight, nine days in advance. You literally had, I don't know, an hour, maybe two in advance. This is going to be live on YouTube in less than 24 hours. They did 110,000 streams. Uh, that's just absolutely fantastic. Really fantastic. And I didn't notice too, that, um, since the beginning of the summer, there's something like 200,000 more people have subscribed just to uh, stardom on YouTube. So again, you can like what you like, brother, but you know me, I'm a numbers guy. That's how you judge certain things. Wrestling is subjective, just like just about everything else in life. This can be your favorite. That can be your favorite. But the numbers don't lie. When you see numbers like 110,000 streams to your show uh, in less than 24 hours, and then yet your fact that you went up about 200,000 subscriptions in the last four or five months to your YouTube channel, uh, you know, there's a lot of big numbers that Stardom are a lot of impressive numbers that Stardom are pulling out, my friend. Let's go through those results then for this show. Um, we started with a tag team match: Azumi and Zena defeating Kagame and Rani Yagami with Azumi getting the pinfall over Rani Yagami with a diving double foot stomp in 12 minutes and 22 seconds. Six woman tag: the EXV team of Mina Shirakawa, Wax Sukiyama, and Rian getting another victory. Defeated the Cosmic Angels team of Aya Sakura, Sayaka Karora, and Yuna Mizumori. Um, Mina Shirakawa getting the pinfall with the implant DDT in nine minutes and fifty two seconds. Why did Aya Sakura lose this match? But that's by the by. Um, Neo Genesis, Starlight Kid, Meitera, and Suzu Suzuki defeated the Stars team of Hazuki Momokogo and Hanan Meitera getting the pinfall with a shooting star in 10 minutes and 36 seconds. Eight-woman tag, the hate team of Momo Watanabe, Rina, Konami, and Tekla defeated the God's Eye team of Siori Saki Kashima, Lady C, and Hina Konami. Again, the pinball with a buzzsaw kick in 12 minutes and 23 seconds. In your semi-main event, the Stars team of Mai Wotani and Saeeda defeated the EXV team of Micah and Hanako, with Mai Wotani pinning Hanako with the Dragon Suplex in 16 minutes and 40 seconds. And then in your main event, the 33rd Artist of Stardom Champions, Cosmic Angels, Tam Nakano, Natsupu and Sioriano, defended successfully by defeating the hate team of Natsuko Tora, Sayakamatani, and Ruwaka Sayoriano, pinning Sayakamatani with the pottery in 16 minutes and 44 seconds to achieve their first successful title defense. Uh, just to remind you all that this is Tam Nakano's fourth individual reign, Natsupu's third, and Sayoriano's second. Um, Matt, obviously, the main thing of this show was that Artist of Stardom championship match, which saw another fantastic exchange between Saya Kamatani and Sayoriano. What else would you like to talk about before we get into these two main event matches? You know, just to, for the sake of time, I'll just kind of, you're just going to give my, it, it was good, it was solid, but it's it basically what it boils down to. And I, I don't mean to be disrespectful when I say this. It's just, it's really a two card mat, uh, show. It really is. So um, and again, just for the sake of time, my friend, um, I have here, let's see, match number one, the four way. I had at three and a half stars. Match number two, um, EXV versus Cosmic Angels. I had three and a quarter stars. Match number three, Neo Genesis versus Stars. I had it three and three fourths. That was actually probably the standout from the undercard. Mm-hmm. Match number four, which is basically kind of like your tag team primer for that tag team championship match coming Cork and Hall with God's Eye versus um, Hate. I had it three and a half stars. 
And that takes us to uh, these last two matches, because that's basically, in my opinion, where this uh, show really picks up. Yeah, it was an entertaining opener. Azumi and Xena vs. Kogama and Rani Agami, especially as it was done in the absence of Mio Amasaki. Nice to see Rian get the pinfall. Well, a, a victory, not the pinfall itself. Um, but it does beg the question why we couldn't give Cosmic Angels the win there ahead of the challenge for Aya Sakura. But again, I don't want to sound like I'm flogging a dead horse or like a stuck record, so we'll move on. Neo Genesis and Stars. Again, the story with Hazuki. That is the linchpin of this entire match. The fact that Starlight Kid now has almost taken on a Kogama-like role in Hazuki's development in terms of this sort of slump that she finds herself in, I really enjoy. I'm enjoying the fact that it's not just people who are in her group that are going, snap the hell out of this. You saw how annoyed Yuna Mizumori was that she wasn't getting peak Hazuki in the match with Cosmic Angels, and now Starlight Kid is getting really, really, really annoyed with Hazuki. And that's something that obviously I am in complete agreement with you. I think we are going to get a singles match between Starlight Kid and Hazuki, and it will sort of it will have wider implications, whether that is it's the match that snaps Suzuki out of her funk, whether it's a number one contendership match for the Wonder of Stardom Championship. There is going to be something there. Um, and then, yeah, hate, hate, gotta hate. Let's let's just leave it at that. Um, tag match then. The Stars vs. CXV match. This was great. This was really, really good, Matt. Yeah. Yeah, you know, here comes Mayu, you know, just another another phenomenal match in her catalog of great matches uh, this year. Not this year, but I mean, in her career, I mean, she's just on another level. Hanako, they do a great job with Hanako just running through Saeed and Mayu Iwatani to start this match off again, emphasizing that, uh, you know, this is the person that we're going to be pushing a little bit here. Uh, ultimately, though, it's Mayu and Saeed some teamwork that chops down the dominant rookie. Eventually, Mike is able to come in and clean house a little bit. Crowd is really, really hot i mean there's no you basically have two baby face tag teams four wrestlers that are really getting over with the crowd so it's not like they're booing one or cheering the other they're cheering for all four wrestlers and all two teams they're really really hot towards the end of this match here um i have a note here i would love to see a mayu versus hanako match singles match i know we got it right before hanako came over to the states for that four or five week excursion but i would love to see one somewhere in the future because hanako is on a completely different level we're putting more steam behind her again we have the new look for her, but a lot of this match is Mayu versus Hanako, and obviously Mayu does a great job pulling Hanako up. That's what's great about these starter main eventers is they take these wrestlers on the bottom card and the middle of the card and then make them look like that they can belong and they can hang, and that's what Mayu does, and Hanako does a great job holding her own up against the icon of starting with Mayu. Obviously some great stuff with Micah and Saeeda. They don't get as much Mayu as Micah as I would like to see. Obviously they had a great, great match on the final night of the five our Grand Prix, but ultimately this comes down to really, really great stuff with Hanako and Mayu that Mayu is able to use a um, is able to use a dragon suplex that puts away uh, basically, you know, uh, the, 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 new, the new pet project from Stardom that they're doing a great job. Terrific, terrific match. Great, great output here from all four of these wrestlers, but I'm so impressed by what they're doing with Hanako. And even though she eats the L here, she comes out of this match, in my opinion, the MVP of this match. I had it at four stars terrific stuff here i mean that's quite the the compliment that you have got micah and mayu iwatani in this match and it's hanako you are giving the mvp award to um and it goes to show you know a very brief excursion less than a month and look at what it's done for her like even just the fresh coat of paint the new moveset and not even the new moveset just a new finish and a new attitude and it is like she is a brand new wrestler um, and that confidence as well that she's getting from the series of wins. Yes, she lost here. Yes, she got pinned by Azumi. But, you know, she was dominant against Azumi until she got rolled up. And she was dominant here until she lost to, again, Mayu Iwatani. Everybody's lost to Mayu Iwatani. At one point, Mayu Iwatani lost to Mayu Iwatani. So, you know, everyone is losing to the top of the company. And I think Hanako is doing a great job of sort of asserting herself on this stardom roster um uh, artist of stardom championships match matt this was the sort of the main point of this show um uh, i think it was a great match 
I think the stuff between Sayoriano and Saya Kamatani was the best bit of the match. I don't know when people are going to realise that trying to jump hate before the bell is a terrible idea, especially as it just means that we go on another round of chair bowling. But again, once we got through the brawling on the outside and we got through a little bit of the the slow control segment that Hay had, and we got to Sayakamatani, uh, Sayakamatani, Sayakamatani, and Sayoriano, and Sayakamatani and Tam Nakano, the pace really, really, really picked up. Yeah, we started this match off, you know, a tie's got a wedo tie. I guess that saying will never get old between us, partner, but hate's got to hate. Yeah, we start out with a big brawl, chair bowling all over the place, and it's not like this is a singles match or even a tag match. You have six people in here, so we get three-fourths of the arena is getting chair bowling at the same time. So, again, you got the main event, the last match of the this uh, are the last match of this, these four shows we're going to review. Um, and you're getting a wild brawl to start on this championship match. Again, that is built up so properly, especially with Saya Kamatani versus Soriano. And again, the Cosmic Angels or the Work Rate Angels, as we call them, are in a lot of trouble early on in this match because hate is wrestling their style match. Turns into a lot of heat onto Soriano, and rightfully so. The last match was a 50 50 split between the crowd. They just want to see great wrestling. But this is like 90 to 10 like as far as what the crowd wants to see they want to see cosmic angels be able to make that comeback and they're able to defeat the big bad heel it's very much like a 1970s 1980s style psychology early on in the match where you get that heat eventually hot tag to tam nakano and then this thing goes to another level we get some great back and forth stuff here between both these two teams tor does a great job playing her role Ruwaka as well. Ruwaka is probably the low man on the totem pole or low lady on the totem pole in this match because you have Tor, former red belt champion, Kamatani, former white belt champion, or Anu. You have all these great stars that have held the big belts in this company, but Ruwaka does a great job in her placement of what she needs to do and getting proper heat at the proper time, which I thought was great. Eventually, this match goes back out to the floor. Saya Kamatani hits uh, maybe the greatest springboard planche in the history of pro wrestling because I don't know of another wrestler that does as well as she does. Again, I'm not, how can anybody boo that? Um, really great stuff here. And then we get some great back and forth stuff with Anu and Kamatani. Eventually, this turns into uh, the, a little bit of a six person, almost tornado tag match that we do see eventually the Cosmic Angels get the advantage of. When we don't get the hand holding dive, Rob, we even get the triple hand holding dive. As we do get Natsupoi, Tam Nakano, and um, Soriano, uh, they all do a dive where Tam and Natsupoi do the dive to the floor. Soriano is able to hit the missile dropkick onto Saya Kamatani. We get some great stuff back and forth between Kamatani and uh, Soriano, where eventually Soriano is able to get the potter ring onto Saya Kamatani for the three count. I had this at four stars. This was a great match and a great way to start the Cosmic Angels run as the Artists of Stardom champions. I suppose the question is as we move, you know, towards the end of the year. I mean, we are getting startlingly close to October, which is uh, which is quite scary when you think about it. Who do you put up against the Cosmic Angels next? I know who I would put up against them, um, but I imagine if you put this team up against them, you'd also want them to win the belts. Um, so who would you put against the Cosmic Angels next in line? Because we didn't get a challenge, at the end of this, um, presumably we will get something at the end, you know, during the Goddess of Storm Tag League. Um, but who do you think and where do you think we're going with this? It's a great question. And I started to doing a great job giving these championship matches on the Stardom World shows, right? So maybe that's where you go. You don't have to go to a big pay per view. And considering the fact that Poi and Tam are your two big champions of this company. I mean, you can run uh, EXV, but like instead of maybe Rina, or, or excuse me, Rian, um, Waka, and maybe Mina, like something like that, where you can do that. You can do stars. You can have like Kagama tell Hazuki, hey, let's go for the artist belts to kind of pump her up. Where it's like maybe the two of them and maybe Ida, and they Ida fall there to kind of further the Hazuki story. Or you can do something with, Mom, you know, have Momo Kogo involved as well. You can really go any one of the factions. I mean, if you want a hot, hot match, um, you know, maybe the main event of Corkin or something like that coming up in between these pay-per-views. You can do the Cosmic, you can do the Work Rate Angels versus maybe uh, Suzu, Starlight Kid, and Izumi, or any any three of the five of Neo Genesis, because Neo Genesis is a hot, hot item right now. Um, 
really you can go any which way with it because of just how well the tag division is in stardom and how great Tam, not to point sorry, Anu are, are as a trio. But my guess would be just to kind of maybe pad up the rain. It, I think it'd be something really cool to see Waka, Rian, and then maybe uh, uh, Mina Shirakawa um, because basically you're giving a rook and somebody that uh, like Waka that's really, really been putting in the work, you give them kind of a big match. That would be my guess, partner, but uh, I mean, your guess is as good as mine. Um, agreed. Um, I personally, the reason that I said is because ideally I'd want Neo Genesis going for them. The only thing I think is, they win them. That's the I thing. Think what they, I, think, I think they win them. I mean, yeah. then again, the artist belts, and again, we're in this era where we're kind of hot potatoing things, but the artist belts really. Really, you know, with the exception of a few runs mm. over the last five or six years, our belts you see a V2, V3, V4, or eventually they change. So maybe you do one, and then as you're building up to Sumo Hall, uh, then maybe that's where the change happens. Regardless, my man, I- I'm all for it. I just want to see some really great wrestling. And again, Tam, Natsupoi, and uh, Soriano, like you said, with Mayu, they can wrestle three broomsticks, and it's going to be a great match. Yeah, and... You know, looking at the 33 artists of stardom champions, there is only one, two, three, four, five. There are only five teams out of the 33 that have got four or more title defenses. And there are a hell of a lot of teams that have actually lost the belts without defending them. So it's, I think it's probably the belts historically that stardom care the least about. However, I do feel that they've done a better job over the last maybe two years, three years, maybe since, do you know what? In fairness, since Cosmic Angels held them as um, Tam Mina and Unagi, I'd argue that since then they have rehabbed that. And I think that's a really good, a really good thing Um, in terms of who next. Yeah, you can, you can, I think that a cha- an artist of Stardom Championship match between Neo Genesis and Cosmic Angels easily headline- headlines a Corrigan. Easily. Um, and I think you draw bums on seats for that because I know that Neo Genesis are incredibly popular at the moment. So, uh, yeah, I mean, what, Starlight Kids, Azumi, Miyu Amasaki, maybe? And it doesn't. It, pick any three of the five out. It's going to be great. You know what I mean? I I just think it would be good to have a little bit more exposure on Mio Amasaki. Um, you know, Macey was already the high speed champion. You've got Suzu Suzuki as challenging for the red belt. Give Mio Amasaki something. Um, now, Matt, we are two and a half hours into this podcast, and hopefully, listener retention has been uh, retained because I think I, for one have never been more excited for an EO and Kyrie watch than I am right now. Absolutely. You're going to have to wait literally 45 seconds till I get to the main part because not only do we have EO and Kyrie on Raw, which is what I want to talk to you about, but real quick, we had Kyrie on Speed. Well, that sounded bad. Kyrie was <laughs> wrestling on the Speed show. Cheapers, creepers. So Kyrie is in the quarterfinals of this Speed tournament. Wrestling Electra Lopez. Electra Lopez is a very powerful wrestler that kind of dominates Kyrie early on. Eventually, Kyrie is able to use her speed to get the advantage. Hits an insane cutlass. I mean, this thing rang throughout the arena that leads to the corner sliding D and the insane elbow for the three count. Now, we have Kyrie and Io both in the semifinals of this tournament. So, there is a possibility we may get one or both members. Uh, are both members of Damage Control, EO and Kyrie, in the finals of this tournament, Rob, and what a treat that would be if we get an EO and Kyrie match, even though we may only get it for three minutes. But regardless, we have EO and Kyrie both in the semifinals of the Speed Tournament. Now, Rob, maybe I'm reaching for straws here. Maybe I'm grappling for straws. Maybe that's just me being the positive person that I am. Well, we go to Monday Night Raw, Fire and Dawn. The Unholy Union versus Io and Kyrie. For Io and Kyrie come out, Biel, Bianca, Bianca Belair and Jade Cargill are all up in their faces in the gorilla position. Obviously, this is the match we're going to, right? We mentioned last week the phenomenal, phenomenal match between Io and Bianca Belair. Io and Bianca come out, and the announced team says, it's a match of the year candidate. Everybody's talking about. On Busted Open, the podcast, 
they talked about how great this match was. Not only was it busted, and I'm paraphrasing, not only was it busted open that talked about this match, all the other top podcasts were talking about this match. Now, Rob, they didn't mention the Stardom cast. They didn't mention me. They didn't mention you. <laughs> I'm going to ask you two questions, sir. Last week, did we talk about this match? Yes. Check. Are we not a top podcast, sir? <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> Yes, yes, we are. And folks, that is just really, and obviously I'm joking, I'm jesting, but in all, in all fairness, in all honesty, that is just our way of saying thank you because this is like the sixth or seventh week in a row that we have finished in the top 10 rated pro wrestling podcast in all of America, which still blows our minds. So again, maybe I'm grappling for straws. They did say all the top, top rated podcasts were talking about this match. We talked about it and technically we're a top rated podcast. So I don't know. Maybe that's just me. Uh, they gave me an inch and I went for a mile. Regardless, Rob Goodwin, this match was absolutely fantastic. Io Shirai comes in, opening up a show ties for everybody. Kyrie and Io, Io use very, they must have been watching their best of stars DVDs because it was a very Mayu, Kagama, uh, Hazuki, a lot of stars like teamwork in this match early on for the shine. Eventually, though, we do get some heat on to Kyrie. I've noticed this in this matches that Kyrie takes the heat because I think Kyrie's a better seller than EO. Not by much, but obviously the hot tag, the more explosive offense comes from EO. Again, not by much. That's what you always want to do. And not only that, but EO is more over than Kyrie because of what EO has been able to do uh, in WWE over the past year. So we get some really, really good heat on Kyrie. And actually, the heat starts with by Fire and Don going to Kyrie's injured eye that she injured a couple weeks ago, diving headfirst into a table because Kyrie's nuts and we love her. So I really liked how that they were able to get some great crowd reaction, great crowd heat from that, because when EO tags in and she comes in with the running uh, show ties and the bullet trains and the double knees to everybody, the place goes absolutely ballistic. Some really, really good stuff here. EO comes in with the handspring drop kick. The uh, springboard Josie drop kick to both fire and Don. Again, the crowd is really, really hot uh, back and forth. Um, eventually, though, we do see the little bit of teamwork on fire and Don to stop EO's onslaught. Kyrie comes in for the save. She's able to to pitch Don to the floor, or excuse me, pitch fire to the floor. Um, Kyrie hits the insane elbow onto the uh, onto Albert Fire onto the floor. That leaves Io Shirai to hit the moonsault onto Isla Don for the three count. Thus, it really looks like maybe uh, next week at the pay per view at Bad Blood, we are definitely building to an I, uh, Io and Kyrie versus Bianca Belair and Jade Cargo match. And I am all for it because let me tell you something, folks. Io and Kyrie are crazy over on these pack pack Monday Night Raw shows. Yeah, um, they are often the uh, the most gift things on uh, on Twitter, which and. I've seen loads of things about how EO is basically carrying the women's division. I think that's, you know, I don't think that's fair when you look at the depth of the women's division. But, you know, EO Sky is also a generational talent. So, you know, maybe she is. Maybe she is. Um, and again, that match with Bianca Belair was absolutely tremendous. I have actually had the chance to go back and watch it. And yes, it, it is that good. Go and check it out. Um, Kyrie is tremendous especially as the fact that she's wrestling with one eye as well i think that goes to show just how good she is um but mr matt turner that does bring us to the end of this episode of the stardom cast thank you so much guys for hanging out with us today just to give you a little bit of a rundown of what's going to happen next week by the time our episode drops it will be the 4th of october for you lovely people on the free feed which means that we will be looking at reviewing the corican hall show and the new blood show both of which are airing live on stardom world we'll also have our preview of the Nagoya Golden Fight pay-per-view because the card will have been announced by then. Of course, Suzu Suzuki versus Tam Nakano for the World of Stardom Championship and Mayu Iwatani versus, Suzu, uh, versus Tony Storm Sorry for the IWGP Women's Championship has already been confirmed for that show. Um, thank you to everyone for watching, listening, subscribing. We, we really do appreciate every single one of you and it really does mean the absolute world to us thank you if you haven't already subscribed maybe consider subscribing leaving us a five-star review and a comment is a free way to really really help the podcast out and help us be exposed to even more people um that would really help us out and help us spread the word of joshi as well which is the whole point 
of this podcast in reality. Um, you can also check out the website www.thestardomcast.com for all of our archived episodes, our Patreon episodes, all of the news and stats coming out of both Stardom and Marigold as well. Um, if you want all of these episodes early and ad-free, you can subscribe to our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash the Stardom Cast for all of those episodes early and ad-free for as little as one dollar a month we have tiers for all price points we'd love to see you over there um you can also find us on social media at the stardom cast you can talk to me on twitter at real rob goodwin mr matt turner why don't you sign us off good sir absolutely sir questions comments suggestions anything you need need from me just want to have a general chat about anything matt turner of on the instagram and or the twitter is the best way to get a hold of me if you want to shoot me an email that's perfectly fine as well the email address to get a hold of me is the stardomcast 22 at gmail.com folks that's gonna wrap it up for another fantastic episode like rob said and i have said before folks we greatly appreciate your support it really does mean the world to us it is absolutely mind-blowing that we are the numbers that we're seeing and the fact that we're uh, cracking the top 10 for podcasts and that we're just going to keep the stardom train and the marigold standard train going because uh, like i said we can't do without you we greatly appreciate your support because like i always say it's just not my podcast it's our podcast because we're all together and everyone's different everyone's special <laughs> <laughs>